the Know Your Gear podcast. Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to the Know Your Gear podcast. This is episode 337. I hope everybody had a fantastic week. And uh, and it's Veterans Day weekend. So I think uh, today is the observance day, right? So today uh, they observe it, but I think it's officially tomorrow. I think that's what I saw on the ca- uh, calendar. So uh, happy Veterans Day to all our veterans and uh, thank you for your service. I think it's the only way you can really start a show on, on a Veterans Day weekend. And um, all right, so uh, let's get into a few things. First things first, uh, if you see somebody with blue name and wrench, that means our moderator, they're here just to help me. They can send me extra questions or help you with uh, questions or issues you're having. Uh, also, uh, if you see somebody in green, that just means they're a member, uh, channel members and patrons are the support of the channel. They literally are the sponsor of all 337 episodes have been sponsored and continue to be sponsored by you guys, which is pretty amazing though. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, every time I, I say it out loud, it still sounds pretty, pretty amazing and crazy. So what are we going to do? We have so much to talk about. A lot of stuff happened this week, I think, right? A lot of guitar stuff, um, but also some good questions and subjects sent in by you guys throughout the week. And of course on the show right now. So I think I'll just get into, uh, what let's get into stuff. Let's just, get, let's just hop in. Uh, let's see. Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> this one was an early question. It came in. It says, hey, Phil, have you ever tried or played the Kiesel Leia? Uh, if yes, how does it compare to the light blue Delos? He's, he's uh, referring to my uh, my Delos headless or my copper penny Delos, which is the same. Uh, my headless, at least. Um, so uh, any issues uh, carrying uh, on the, uh, the Delos on the plane? Okay, so uh, two questions. We can hit both. So I was able to pick up a Leia uh, at uh, Kiesel when I did the factory tour. So you guys know, this is an actually interesting question because I'm sure um, maybe you'll understand. It's a headless guitar, but Kiesel makes a bunch of headless guitars. And the Leia is like super tiny. It's a tiny guitar. Um, you can get it in uh, 24 and three quarters or 25 and a half inch scale. But I can tell you right now, no matter which scale you get, that guitar is tiny. It's got to be, it was such a small body and small size guitar that um, that I wasn't even sure it was full size to any degree, but it is. It's a full size guitar, no matter what scale you get. So if you're looking for like that ultimate tiny headless guitar to play on the couch or play, you know, on, or take it traveling, uh, for sure. Um, now here's what I don't know, and I can try and find out, but I'm going to tell you what I think. So I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to give it my best guess, and I think I'm about... 75% there. Um, I don't think the headless guitars have different size gig bags like lengthwise. So even though Leia seemed a little smaller than the Delos, I don't think the gig bag is much physically shorter. It can be, I just don't know. It might be more narrow, but it's not, then look a lot smaller. Um, so uh, you might not get a much smaller gig bag. But that brings me to the second question. Um, taking the guitar on the plane. I took my uh, Delos, headless Delos with me on vacation. There is a video coming. I made a video when I was on vacation. Uh, you guys will see it. I sent it to the patrons and members uh, earlier in the week. And um, that's the version they got. I have to edit it. I was editing in slow. Editing was slow and hard on the laptop. So I got a version done and I was like, I don't know. So let me, let me, punch it up and, and, and clean it up a little bit on the main computer at home. But in there, I was using my headless Delos. Um, I was able to take it with me and take it on the plane. So what I did was uh, I just carried it over my shoulder. Uh, it de- absolutely fit in the overhead compartments with no issues whatsoever. And um, because the Kiesel gig bag is so thick, um, uh, the uh, they told me, <laughs> the Kiesel guys told me I could throw it off the second, uh, second story of the building. They, they actually offered that to me. I didn't do it. I don't know why we didn't do it, but they offered, I said, I could just go do that if I want to with a guitar in it. And I was like, no, I'm okay. I get it. (laughs) So, um, so, uh, long story short, I was prepared to gate check it if I, if I was, uh, if I had to, but I did not have to. So if you're ever taking a guitar on a plane, um, what you want to do is carry the guitar on the plane. So when you check in your luggage, if you're checking any luggage, you just tell them at the, at the, uh, 
luggage check in and you get your tickets that you want to gate check the guitar. I, I just say that no matter what, that way they don't want to ask anything. Um, <laughs> what that means is you're going to go to the gate and then hand it to them at the gate. They'll put it on the plane last like strollers and wheelchairs and pull it off first and hand it back to you. But like I said, in my situation, both times there was room in the overhead compartment. So we would put it in there because it fit no problem. So I was able to take it in uh, both directions with no issues. So that's what you can do for, the, for reference. If your guitar is bigger than the overhead compartment, then you have a trouble. You're going to have to ask, you know, to see if it can go in the pilot's closet or somewhere like that. Hold on. But remember, you can always gate check the guitar, um, which is, like I said, it will be the last thing they put on the plane when you, before you guys take off. It's the first thing they pull off the plane and they'll get it to you before you even get, you know, leave your gate to go get your luggage. So it's as long as it's in a safe case uh, or something you trust, maybe consider that as an option. That's so that's answer both those questions for you. <laughs> that helps. Uh, Let's see. Um, Fast Freddy 33 says, is that guitar smaller than a Steinberger? So the Leia is, so I, ironically, when, when I was on vacation, I went to an amazing music store um, called Bounty Music and I met a bunch of the guys there and I was able to talk to them briefly. And uh, it was an amazing store. Um, so shout out to Bounty's, Bounty Music in, um, in Maui. And um, uh, I was I went there and I bought a guitar stand. I needed a guitar stand, <laughs> so I got a fold-up guitar stand and I think a clip-on tuner. And uh, I know the irony of it, right? <laughs> I have all these clip-on tuners here at the house, but um, I needed something uh, just to you know to to make sure the guitar is safe putting in a stand. So I went there and of course they had so many great guitars. There was a V guitar that I was considering a Gibson V. They had a really good deal on it, like sixteen ninety-nine, and uh, I almost went back. I almost went back for it, but. You know, uh, <laughs> got to pay for the vacation. So the guitars were really just an afterthought at that point. But a uh, great store. And um, like I said, I was able to get a guitar stand and stuff like that. But the question was, uh, is the Leia as small as a, a, a Steinberger, right? Because I think that's what the question is, right? You were asking about the Steinberger, not the Strandberg, right? I just want to make sure. Yeah, Steinberger. Very important, right? Strandberg is like, that's a Strandberg I'm pointing at right now, which is my seventh string. Um but a Steinberger, if you guys remember, is a small paddle-shaped guitar. That's what's interesting. Um, Bounty Music had some there. It's the first time I've seen those in years in person. You know, I, I had probably hadn't seen one in about five years uh, in person. And they had a bunch there, bass and electric guitar. So looking at them freshly in the last couple of days, like I have, um, I would say they're still, the Steinberger is slightly smaller just because it's, you know, it's obviously just like a paddle. Um but lengthwise, oh, I, I definitely think they were the same. I might consider the Leia shorter, but it, I don't know if it was. But I can tell you it wasn't longer. So not much different size. But I can tell you right now, between the two, I would pick the Leia just because, you know, a little bit more comfortable. But the, the Steinbergers were a deal, man. I think they had them for like $2.99 or $3.99. Obviously, they're, you know, Asian imports. They're not made in USA stuff. But anyway, $3.99, that's still a really great price. So check them out they i think they have stuff online too you can check them out and support them that way too so look at that but great guitars great store and uh thank you guys at the store again it was great getting to meet you and talk to you all uh they were super nice like i said super nice it's always great when you walk into the store everybody's super friendly they were what well, they were super busy uh that's my my wife was with me and shauna noticed that they were super busy and she was like that's great you know right because you never know because it's a smaller store but it was packed to the gills with great gear i mean that was it was packed. <laughs> it was the, probably the most packed uh, mid-sized store that I'd seen in a, in a long time with selection. It was crazy. So it was great to see. Um, as I say, um, uh, uh, Matt says, always fun to check out guitar shops while on vacation. Yeah, you know, it was, um, uh, I wanted, I, I had initially thought I was going to go see Lahana music. I'm, I hope I'm not saying the name wrong. Uh, I learned that uh, I don't do very well with Hawaiian names. <laughs> there's just there's something in my brain that just doesn't click that way. You know, when I went to Europe, you know, other languages, I, I say it horribly, but at least I can click. It's just uh, just the Hawaiian language for some reason. It's like it's just something about the pronun pronunciations just really don't click to me really well. But I wanted to go Lohana music, but unfortunately. Um, you know, that they, they burned down in the fires and, um, you know, that was just horrible. And so one of the things we want to do was, uh, cause our trip was booked over a year ago was go and frequent as many 
uh, smaller businesses we can uh, frequent as much uh, as much non corporate entity entities as we can, and kind of infuse our cash into the uh, local economy. That was kind of the the main goal. Um, obviously, it's you know it was really good, and I have to tell you, I don't want to go on a t- uh, tirade about it, but it was such an amazing experience with the people being so amazing everywhere we went. Uh, it was just friendly and fun. So it was great. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Let's, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, this one comes from Ryan. Ryan Wells Music wants to know, when do I think the resale market will recover? So by recover, you mean the prices go back up or the volume increase again? Um, so the, that is a tough question question. I'm not a, you know, obviously, you know, anyway, if I knew the answer, boy, I'd be rich. Right. Um, but I'd like to actually segue that question into something that's probably right now, something I'm observing, which is the market is not doing bad. It's doing really well. It's still doing really well. Um, when I look at the data that I can access where with sales data, which is like I said, you can do that through, through the fact that we do so much affiliate marketing plus just, you know, I'm, I'm obviously have a, a finger on the pulse, so to speak of the industry, uh, with friendships and stuff and, and, and some of the stuff I do behind the scenes behind YouTube. And what I can tell you is, is that yes, obviously the numbers are down, but they are still really good. I mean, if you look at, overall sales, it's still crazy. Um, it's just not the Christmas everyday crazy sales that the COVID, uh, environment created. Um, last month. So you give your reference, um, last month was the highest affiliate month I've ever had since the one peak month and during COVID. Um, so, Although this year, obviously, you know, if you look at just uh, how affiliate dollars are clicked, what you guys are clicking on there on the on the different, you remember I have like a thousand videos that get, you know, you know, tens of millions of views a year collectively um, through all the random clicking and stuff. You can kind of see the data, what guitar players react to and what they're buying. The numbers are down from last year by by a good amount. I, I could I could look, but just maybe that's a different show one time we'll we'll go through the analytics maybe i'll share that with you guys but here's the important part um you can see it there's still peaks and there's still high amount of volume it's just not the volume it was you know a year or two ago and but the volume now is still higher much higher than 2019 so same same thing and and i can see that even with silly things like the merch here and i know that's really not a good connection but you know we did the limited edition zither stands uh you know we did a run of zither stands you guys a bunch of you guys bought them we didn't sell as many as we did at the peak of covid but the number we sold was still extremely higher so you know it was um i mean it's a 200 hundred dollar guitar stand that's a very very expensive item and a very luxury item to get and by the way i appreciate you guys getting those because not only like i said it's support zither who's a mom pops uh, business but it supports the channel and it was and it's a cool stand it's my favorite stand right in fact i have one oh just you can barely see it i'm pointing right there it's right there um but even then uh i thought if we sold 10 you know that would be a lot for a mention on a podcast and then we sold quite a few and then i I remember telling Shauna, like, wow, we sell 20, 25. That's going to be really good. And I don't know what the exact number is now. I thought she had told me 35 or 36 so far. So that was crazy to see that. So you guys, I see people still spending, higher end guitars still spending, people still buying stuff. The stores seem to be moving inventory. There's just, obviously, there's a glut of inventory. There's a lot of inventory out there. And also, like I said, you're just not going to see the numbers like you did uh, just a you know year or two. I don't know if we'll ever see those numbers again. I had never seen those numbers before in the 20 years I've been in this industry. I don't know if I'll ever see them again. <laughs> so um, my nose is itching. I apologize. Two things are happening to me, by the way. I uh, spent a week away from home, no dogs, and um, my uh, <laughs> came home, and so the dogs are very excited to see us. And my daughter came, and my son, they were uh, house sitting, and they brought the cat. 
and I guess no one decided to vacuum or let the vacuum cleaner go. So very a lot of dog fur. And then our neighbors today are uh, reseeded for winter winter grass, and they, they they came and ground down the dirt. And it was just I'm having uh, I've taken everything I can, but I can tell you I'm just itchy and watery eyed. So just being just be aware. <laughs> That that's happening okay so if i keep itching that's what it is um all right uh but what was i okay we were talking about that uh the, the market as i got sidetracked um and uh the uh so like i said i i still think the the gear is still good used is good just prices are down but i think prices are become just more more towards realistic because they did get very unrealistic those numbers are crazy oh that's what i was gonna say that's what i missed um I had heard when I, the whole time we had a store, like I said, almost 13 years, um, I had heard from owners that I knew and hung out with that had stores for, you know, 30, 40 years before me. Um, they would constantly talk about like the Eddie Van Halen, Eddie Van Halen 80s era of guitar sales as being this epic thing that's never been since. And that's what I kind of feel like COVID was, was <laughs> that's probably what I could imagine the numbers probably look like uh, where they would just sell guitars at that level. So, but Ryan, um, that's what I think. I think that will it recover? I, I don't know, um, but I don't think it's, I, I think a lot of people now, I hear people going, oh, it's a pain in the ass to sell a piece of gear, a used piece of gear. And I'm like, it's not really not. It's just not, you know, you got drunk on how easy it was. I, I think the companies are really, really, the the companies that don't pay attention have really, really had a, uh, you know, rude awakening with the whole, you mean, what do you mean we didn't sell out in the first two hours? What do you mean we didn't sell out in five minutes? You know, what do you mean we don't have two years of back order on this? Uh, you know, that just wasn't normal. So to, to, to talk like that, it was normal. It's just not going to be realistic. Um, uh, Mr. Nobody says more realistic pricing to damn right. Yeah, that's right. Like I said, more, um, like I said, I keep seeing the prices come more in line to what I think they probably should be. <laughs> Cause like I said, it seems great, crazy. Um, Let's see. Um, okay. Yeah, Sunbase is also saying used prices were higher than new because we couldn't get new new guitars. Exactly. Like I said, those those just getting psychotic high prices and selling super fast. Um, I remember during COVID vividly that um, I I. I remember the first time I realized something was happening during the COVID guitar market was um, we had took a bunch of gear that either companies had sent and had been here for a long time and I wasn't using it. And I was like, okay, let's get rid of that. And then some gear I just wanted to sell. And cause I turn all that, I turn all that churn, all that money back into the channel, you know, get other piece of gear, get you know, more videos, right? Everything's, you know, uh, you know, to get another video, right? It's really, really expensive process to, to review gear. And, um, and I gave the gear to to my wife Shauna to put on reverb and she listed it all. And I remember her saying like within minutes of listing, uh, oh, you're going to have to box up that amp. And I'm like, oh, oh, OK. And then I remember I, I went to the kitchen, I got a cup of coffee, it came around. She goes, it all sold. <laughs> it was like an hour. I was like, are you kidding? And she's like, no. I'm like, that's that's nuts. What was that? And I, I didn't know, so I thought I was a big YouTuber. I just thought maybe you guys were all, I'm like, well, they all watch the YouTube channel, and I guess they all like more really want a piece of gear that I touched. I was like, look, Phil McKnight touched that piece of gear. It's worth something. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know that was, it was everybody was selling gear like that. <laughs> but I did have, for, for like at that minute, I had an ego like, well, I guess, I guess I'm something now. <laughs> I didn't really didn't say that, but I we joked about it for sure. I was like, you think it's because I'm like the channel? And she's like, I don't know what it is. And then that's when we kind of figured out that the boom was starting. Um, okay. Oh, uh, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Brian says Phil's DNA is money. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um Okay, let's uh let's go grab another early question and uh uh, this one came from Antique Rocker says, great video on the Strandberg with the true temperament frets. Uh, would they work on an acoustic guitar? Uh, can you replace a Telecaster pickup wire? Oh, wire from pickup. Pickups two pots. Okay, I don't understand the second one. 
So let's go with the first one. Uh, would they wear an acoustic guitar? You know, I will put a link right now. There was a video that I watched briefly of someone on YouTube with True Temperament on acoustic. My brain, by the way, with True Temperament for um, as long as I've had the guitar messing with it, it's it to me, I don't know what the downsides of using it on acoustic guitar is, but to me, acoustic guitar with those frets are would be amazing. So there you go. Um, so, side note, let me just share with you guys because this rarely happens. Um, I will put it in the description down below. In fact, what I'll do is I'll do two things. I'm looking through my email right now. Let me refresh it. By the way, if you guys are watching the show live, I sent out the five winners of the snarks that we were giving away two weeks ago. Remember, we set the contest for today to end, and I already emailed everybody. So you might have an email from me that says, hey, you got two snarks coming. So if you do, uh, just email us back, and I'll make sure they get out to you on Monday. When I say I make sure I get out on Monday, Sean is going to make sure they get out on Monday. Um, so I got an email from, uh, I don't know. It's from, ah, there it is. Okay, it is from the True Temperament guys. So they saw the video and they liked the video and they said that they basically make aftermarket necks for strats, which is something I knew about, but more importantly, they have them in stock, that's good. But they wanted to let me know that they'll give you guys 10% off. Um, it's called Just For You with a capital J. I don't think it matters, but it's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post it here on the live stream. Uh, 10 percent off the neck i don't know anything and i haven't responded to them yet i remember i just got back um but if i get a chance to i'll respond to them in the next 24 hours and let them know maybe if they're interested in sending a neck or something we could build a guitar maybe and then you know that would be a good video i don't i don't know um uh something like that <laughs> okay uh so uh just letting you know they offered the 10% discount. They offered it to me as well, but I'm, I'm going to be straight up with you guys. There's no way I'm buying a neck to buy a body and put all that together. <laughs> it's going to cost me $1,000. And, uh, you know, I, I would be more interested if they're willing to send a neck uh, and maybe even hopefully maybe even co-sponsor some of the other costs of those materials I need to put together a guitar. I'll put together a parts of guitar and I'll give that guitar away. Right. I will absolutely do that for promotion purposes for them. Uh, but, you know, it's it's there. It's obviously, like I said, but I, I just can't justify spending a thousand dollars to make a video that makes one hundred and fifty bucks and takes me two full days or three days to make. It's just not going to be feasible um, for that. But I'm sure they might w work something out. I'm sure we'll work something out, um, but I'll reach out. But I'm letting you know that they have the neck 10 uh, percent off the necks and you can get them aftermarket. But um I was looking at them and I didn't see they had they don't have the nut already installed and stuff so it looks like it looks like it takes a little bit of work. Not much, but a little bit. All right. Okay. As I jump around. <laughs> Let's see. Um uh New Mexico uh Saint says do I have a reverb sellers page? I do. It's the KYG shop, but I haven't sold anything on there in forever. So, um it we're way overdue you know uh to to move some stuff that's been stocking up um but i don't know if we're gonna get to that when we're gonna get to do that it's been it's been busy and of course you know taking a vacation uh was uh obviously makes things uh, makes you a little busier when you get back um randy crooks says hey phil did arrow band reach out to you we talked about this a couple weeks ago airband is the company that was doing the kickstarter they did they i think we figured out they sent us like seven emails um and it wasn't something i was interested in doing so you know that's how it goes <laughs> so the um as you guys saw if you watched the strandberg video that was sponsored by cma the country music association uh youtube channel i'll put a link down below if you guys would click the link and subscribe to their channel. Like, it's just like I'm asking you to subscribe to another channel. Check them out. Just check it out, you know, right? Um, that was really cool. It's a really cool deal that I've done two of their promotions with them. Um, I like it. Um, it totally ethically rides with me. It's not asking you to buy anything. There is no deal here. They just want to start a YouTube channel or get their, you know, the Country Music Association wants to do this 
industry behind the scenes YouTube channel. That's what I like about it. It's right showing you about behind the scenes with the industry and stuff. They're just starting to do it. So it's a nice co-promotion and it helps fund some videos for the channel. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's uh, getting sponsorships is difficult because, like I said, I have to vet everything and look through everything. I'm dealing with a company right now and it's already been two months of vetting them to because <laughs> I don't know much about them before I would, you know, say anything to you guys. Uh, it's tough, like I said, it's, it's, it's a tough thing. So same thing with Aerobrand. Uh, I, you know, as soon as I hear Kickstarter, as soon as I hear any of that stuff, I'm just not interested in, you know, telling you guys to give your money to somebody and then hope that it all works out is just it's too, too scary and, and too unethical for me, uh, to mess with. So, um, Uh, let's see. Bill says, Hey, have you ever tried to intonate your Mira? PRS doesn't mind if you can't. Uh, my Mira is dead on, uh, intonated perfectly with that bridge. So this is a very, uh, common thing. And I, obviously I can't see every guitar in every situation and you understand every player is different. Intonation is more than just the setup of the guitar. It could be the player too. Players are different. Um, you know, for instance, I, I tell you, uh, Bill, it might help you. I, I once had a customer who was the most frustrating repair customer I ever had in my entire life, which was coupled dramatically by the fact that he was a super nice person. Okay. Sounds almost silly what I'm saying, but you can understand when the situation is super stressful, but the person is super amazing it actually makes things worse, <laughs> right? If you've ever had any, if you've ever worked in any service industry and ha and felt like you really had a great person in front of you and you can't solve their problem, it actually aches, your body aches from not being able to take care of this person. And that's how I was with him. And here's what his pro my problem was with him. Um, he liked tall frets and he loved his giant gorilla hands to squeeze the crap out of his strings and they would just go sharp. And I, I've told you, like, I always wonder, like, it, you know, people talk, musicians, guitar players sometimes tell you that going to Nashville is like the real deal. If you go to Nashville, you know, you think you're a great guitar player, these great guitar players, you know, you see guys like Sean Tubbs and stuff and they're amazing, right? And they go, they, you know, and, and you understand like some guitar players are great and they go to Nashville and they go, oh, I thought I was a great guitar player until I saw the, the players in Nashville. I feel that way about guitar techs in Nash Nashville. I feel like they're like, to me, like I like in being a guitar tech to being a mechanic, but then going to Nashville is like, you know, like, like a race car mechanic, right? Like this is the person who's really got their, their crap dialed in. I, I reason I say that is because I have over the years, you know, um, doing setups for players that are intermediate is, you know, is easy. Uh, beginners are definitely easy because they don't have any standard to really gauge you. So you're just kind of trying to make the best for them possible. But pro level players are a little more difficult because they specifically know what they want. But in my experience, the country players sometimes are the most um, difficult to, to get set up because they knew exactly the, what they want. Like I said, I always knew I was in for it when a player would come in and and not tell me how they want their guitar intonated. They would tell me how many cents they wanted flat you know, how many cents, uh, you know, how many cents they want off in each direction on each string <laughs> based on their playing. Like they knew this and, uh, I, I've never had a problem where I couldn't satisfy them, but it was always a little on me. Like, wow. You know, the first time I ever experienced that, I was like, I don't know what this person's talking about. What are you talking about? And you know, like, Oh, this, I want this string <laughs> this way and I want this string this way and and uh and um but you know uh, it, they are not that difficult uh they're difficult but they're not as super difficult because at least they know what they want and you know it's just about working their needs but this particular customer his issue was he liked something that was not really in my opinion was not suited for his style of play in other words I would tell him like your reason your intonation is out is you're pushing you're so strong you're pushing these strings and your frets are so tall, you're pushing them sharp. <laughs> and he would go, no, the intonation's out. I'm like, I'm telling you, like I could hand your guitar to 10 people right now and it's perfect. And they could record the greatest albums in history with perfect intonation, but we have to do, we have to do something different here with you. And uh, this is a process that took a while. And these are one of those things that I talk about where sometimes players love a guitar, I get it, okay? And that guitar is not suiting you the way you play your style and stuff. So when I hear people talk about like, for instance, like the uh, one piece bridge from Paul Reed Smith comes up a lot. Now, this is why this is interesting to me. 
that bridge is no different than an acoustic guitar bridge. It's just not. I mean, it's just not. An acoustic guitar bridge is also very fixed and set. So having individual adjustments for the bridge um, is a fix, and I definitely recommend that. Um, but like I said, in certain players, like I don't, just the way I play, that bridge has no effect on me, and I've had no issues with it with the majority of people. So um, in fact, I really believe, <laughs> I really believe this. Um, I remember... Paul saying something kind of jerky, as sometimes he says things kind of jerky. Um, when he was talking about that bridge, I forgot what we were talking about. There was a bunch of us, and he said, um, he this is before Paul Rismith even had individual saddle uh, one-piece wraparound bridges. They only had the one bridge. And somebody was asking about intonation, and I was in the room, and he said, uh, no, this is the perfect bridge. And then he said, um, because the way it sustains. What he was after was he wanted the vibration, 100% of the vibration of the strings to go into the one piece, into the two studs, into the body. That was kind of what he said. I remember his thing that he said that kind of came off for a second a little harsh was he's like, you would never put a bolt through a church bell. <laughs> I just remember that comment. And we were like, whoa. And um, so he was, I, just trust me, he was never going to uh, change from that bridge ever. And then it was a few years later, you saw the, all of a sudden they would use the individual saddle wrap around bridge. And my, my guess is because eventually the customer wins, right? <laughs> That's how that works. The customers will say, Hey, look, I'm having trouble with this. So in your case, if you, I'm just trying to tell you, if you have an issue with that one piece bridge, what I would do is switch it to the, to the multi saddle bridge. And that will, that will solve your problem with the mirror. But the mirror to me, my mirror is perfect. It's a perfect specimen guitar. And I've told you, the neck moves on it. That's the only thing that it does. Sometimes I have a little bit more, too much relief. Sometimes a little, it buzzes because my neck's pretty thin. That's a thin, it's a wide thin, but it's also a pretty thin wide thin, which is not particularly what I like about the guitar. Just overall, I like the way the guitar is. Um, but that's going to happen. And that's why I said, sometimes it's, we got to look at components as quality, but also you got to match that to the players. Because like I said, I've experienced where just certain players it's tough. It's tough. Um, if they, especially if they don't have, like I have a, a friend, you guys have seen him once before on the show. He's been a couple of years ago. Um, but he's a good friend. His name's Joe. He likes small gauge strings slammed to the deck, but he doesn't mind buzz. Like if it buzzes a little, sizzles a little bit, he's fine. Some players, man, they have to have tiny strings basically right on above the frets and they don't want to hear any buzz. And it's possible, but only if all of the things in the world line up perfectly with the guitar and them and everything. Otherwise they, you know, you gotta have, you know, so I'm just saying you, the guitar could be the issue, but also you and the guitar could be the issue. So just be aware of that. Try to adjust a little bit if you can. And um, so there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, Paul, <laughs> Drew says, Paul has the East Coast, no BS, but also jerky attitude. You know what it is with Paul for me is I, I think, I personally have always thought this, I think he's always thinks he's funny. And sometimes when he says something, I go, and I go, okay, I think he's just trying to be funny. <laughs> I really, I'm not making excuses for him. I could really care less either way. I'm just saying, uh, in all the conversations I've ever uh, been around him and with him having, it's sometimes, uh, I, if you think about it going, uh, you know, I think he's trying to be funny. It's fine. Same thing with troll comments, by the way. I, sometimes uh, when I'm talking to people about comments that are like really trolly, jerky comments online, I go, you know, picture that comment now, picture in your head that that person thinks they're funny. They think that's humorous. Like not because they're a jerk and they get joy out of being a jerk. I'm like, they probably think that was witty and pithy, <laughs> right? Or witty. And, uh, and uh, it, all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, in that context, yeah, everybody's kind of heard somebody with a dry humor. So, um, so, uh, uh, Jeremy says, what is, what is an acceptable height then at what point is too much or what do you do to consider too low? Well, that's for you to decide. That's the best part. There is no, I don't subscribe to the whole, let me tell you where the perfect, t you know, action on a guitar is. Um, that's not what I'm going to, you know, kind of suggest you, what I'll tell you is you have to decide what's right for you, but then you have to understand that if you're going to be more aggressive, in other words, higher action is easier than lower action, right? <laughs> um, the, if you want your setup to be even, you know, lower and the strings to ha to be smaller, like I said, those are two, two contributing factors to buzz, you know, when the notes kind of buzz out and more importantly, not just buzz, but also they, they lose sustain. 
it's not, I'm not, and I'm not saying you have to buy a more expensive guitar. I don't think that's true either. You know, when people go, oh, well, if you buy cheap guitars, don't expect too much. No, no, you can get a Squire out of, a Bullet Squire sometimes will play perfectly just through the law of averages. Like I said, um, um, my, I've said this a long time ago, so it's been a while, so I'll bring it up again. I, I love saying this. Um, anyone can make a great guitar, but making a bunch of great guitars is very hard. That's what you learn at factories, <laughs> right? How do you replicate good or great over and over again? That becomes the biggest hurdle for a lot of companies and a lot of builders and even, you know, even master luthiers, you name it. How do you duplicate this process? Um, and so my argument is, is that when somebody says like a hundred dollar guitar is garbage or $300 garbage, my point without, we're not talking about like going and you do your frets and you do all the work and you may make it better. What I'm saying is if that you've ever played a bunch of nice guitars and played a bad one, then it makes sense that you could play a bunch of bad guitars and then they may accidentally be a good one. Right? So this is something I have experience with during Christmas, especially when we would start stocking the really student grade instruments and we would go through them every once in a while, you just picked up one and you go, Oh, wow. Right. I don't know what it was. Right. Piece the right tree fell on the right day, got on the right truck, got milled at the right time. The right employee worked on it. Everything lined up and this guitar is great. So what I'm basically saying is, is that if you have a high standard for how you want your guitar to play, it's going to be harder to find a perfect guitar, but it can be done. And, you, and again, that's what the search is to find the right guitar for you every time. So there you go. And also I like to also, cause there's certain guitars that I have that are not right for me, but I don't play them as often, but there's, you know, I still push it. You, know, you never know. Something will change. I'll get used to it or I won't. So there you go. Um, okay, let's see. Hold on. <laughs> what I love about comment sections is I say all this stuff and it's always funny to me. One, one word, one thing I say, or one statement seems to be the things that everybody gravitates or catch on to. And then I'm like, Oh, okay. Um, so there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, Oh, also follow up on uh, Jeremy. Um, that's another reason why in the videos I started me measuring, uh, height of the strings as the guitars came out of the box. Um, I've had this a conversation, a deep conversation many times with other YouTube channels and even companies about why as a guitar tech, I don't know why I'm doing these quotes like a guitar tech, but as a guitar tech, why don't I just take the guitar and do the setup and then show you what it should be like after the setup? Why am I kind of measuring it or why am I showing you out of the box? And you know what I, I'm doing that for is, um, is that uh, I like the idea that there's a history to the videos. So for instance, I think it's kind of cool, in my opinion, if you're especially if you're new guitar and you find my channel because I review a guitar that's like $2.99 from Amazon, I can't believe it. And then you watch that video and you hear me critique it, negative and positive, but maybe you don't have a reference of what that even means. Well, isn't it nice you can go, in fact, on my, by my way, on my playlist, I don't know if you guys know this on my YouTube channel, I have playlists uh, to the deep dives by price category. So you can look at every deep dive period, or you can look at only ones under $2,500 or under 2000, under 1500, under a thousand, under I think 800, under 500, under 300. So you can go and look at comparatively and go, okay, well, here's a guitar for 250. He's saying it's pretty good. Let's look at five other guitars. He, he checked out for 250 out of the box. What did they come out like? Or if you're looking at $300 guitar, maybe compare it to the $3,000 guitar I just did. Um, that, by the way, is where some of the clickbait is actually kind of funny because there's sometimes you'll see a clickbait says this $300 guitar puts $3,000 guitars to shame. That's clickbait. However, because obviously it's an intriguing title will get you to click. However, what it comes from is those lists. Because what I'm doing is when I reviewed the video and I'm editing, I'm like, yeah, yeah this video, did, this guitar did. I'm telling you guys actually in the title that this guitar is beating another guitar I reviewed for, the, for a different price point. See, that's what's interesting to me. So it's not just that I'm we're doing the clickbait. I mean, we've got to sensationalize the title a little bit. Remember, like I've said before, uh, I got to compete with, Oh, I got to compete with everything now from you'll never believe what this shark did to this person to you'll never believe 
what's happening in the news today. I mean, everything's on YouTube. It's like everybody's competing with everybody. I got to compete with Kevin Hart. <laughs> he's, he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He's a world known stand up comedian and actor. <laughs> and he's got a YouTube channel that I got to somehow get your guys' attention away from back to guitar. It's, it's kind of actually insane. So like I said, anything we can do <laughs> to get you to maybe, maybe consider looking at the video. It's just, is is that's how it goes. But that's where those titles come from. It's, it, it's, I'm telling you guys, so you guys know now in the future, if you ever see me do that, or we see us say like this guitar blows something out of the way, we're actually talking about the actual other reviews we've done. So, and how we did it, how it stacked up. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, Sebastian says, do you have any comments on of when a guitar should be refretted? That's a great question. Um, and um, here is the easiest answer for you. So depending on the hot, how tall a fret is. So let's start with the jumbo fret wire, like the tallest fret wire. Um, the tallest fret wire, in my opinion, if you like your fret wire to be somewhat tall, you'll get two level and crowns out of it. Okay. So in other words, if you have a divots in it or it has to be, or it's just got a high fret or you have issues that have to be resolved that can't be tapped down or whatever, and you actually have to have somebody level and crown them, you level and crown it, it'll still feel relatively close to what you were familiar with, um, with, uh, when it was new. Okay. The second time you have to do it, in my opinion, on a tall fret, it's not going to feel as tall. It's definitely going to feel more like medium jumbos, not quite vintage fret wire, but it's going to feel smaller and it might feel different to you where your fingers now touch the fretboard when you, you bend a little bit more and that may not be ideal for you. Um, so a lot of, a lot of techs love to say, uh, luthiers too will say, luthiers will say, you get three level and crowns out of a fret. In my opinion, you you can get as many until, I've seen, uh, I, had, I worked on a 60s era SG that played amazing and the frets were literally flat. I'm not exaggerating. They were flat. Like they, I mean, I don't remember the thickness, but I mean, it's paper thin. I mean, it was a, to put it in your mind, think of like a thinner than cardstock. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it played amazing. It was like, almost like playing a fretless, except where you can fill all the notes and had no issues and no buzz. It was just the mystery. Now this one player has owned it his entire life and it just worked out that way. And, uh, the question was exactly what you're asking. Is it time to refret? Well, it plays great. What do you, what do you want? What do you think? Uh, I'll refret it if you want, but it plays fine. And he's like, yeah, I love the way it plays, but I just think cause they're flat. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's totally crazy, man. Your flat, your frets are freaking flat. I mean, it's the weirdest thing I've ever played. However, that's not the question we're asking today. The question we're asking today is you're not having any dead notes. You're not having issues. Do you think it plays horribly? Do you want us to put some tall, you know, frets on it so they fill out, you get the height back? And he's like, I don't know. I've been playing this way for 20 years, almost like this. And I go, well, let's leave it alone. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so he left it alone. So to answer your question is you, you have to replace the frets when you, not so much, because it's time to replace them. It's just, they don't feel the same to you because you've crown and leveled them. This is why sometimes I don't like it that companies uh, crown and level their frets before the guitar ever ships out of the factory. Um, it's, you know, ideally you want everything to not have to be like that. Um, and this is why we started measuring the heights of frets and then I kind of stopped and I kind of went back to it. And this is, this has been problematic for me because there's so many different kinds of fret wire, <laughs> okay, out there. Uh, especially on the on the global scene when you're talking about guitars. And interestingly enough, I've had trouble and I continue to have trouble with companies, especially the Asian import variety of guitars, not the not the brands that are Asian import, but the just any brand importing stuff uh, economy wise out of Asia. They don't even know what fret wire. So I contact them, you know, they ship me the guitar. I'm like, hey, I'm measuring the frets. I want to know what what fret wire you're exactly using so I can tell, so I can figure out if the person at the factory has leveled these frets a little. And they're like, we don't know. And then I go, can you find out? And they always say yes. And then every once, one out of 10 times, if I'm lucky, somebody calls me back or emails me and goes, okay, this is what we got from the factory. Um, but most time they don't know. It's very confusing. So, um, so then I stopped measuring. Cause again, I'm like, you know, it got, it got a lot of, little annoying in the comments because I would measure it and then somebody goes, mine's different. I'm like, yeah, it's because I don't think they're staying as consistent as we think. 
So I'm still working on that stuff. Trust me. It's like, it's working. Like I said, um, one of the problems I have with that type of video content is the companies that I deal with as a whole, with only a few exceptions, really don't really enjoy that part of the content. content. Remember, no one's really sending me a guitar so I can do a deep dive on it. They're sending me a guitar because they think you guys will buy it if you see it. And that's really all they care about. That's why they'll pay a, anyone else a way more than they'll ever think ever working with me about just to unbox it and go, look what they sent me. <laughs> and if I would do that too, I would just, it'd be great. I could make a video a day like that. Every day I just unbox a guitar going, look what they sent me. <laughs> they sent me this. You guys look at that. And they would love me for that because they don't, they don't love it when you kind of, you know, mess with their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, uh, the videos do well and because they do well, the, a lot of companies respond to letting me do stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, New Mexico, a saint says, what do you think of budget guitar trend? Question mark. Seems there is a big following on YouTube for these budget guitar reviews. You know, what's interesting is I have a different opposing theory to that statement. Here's what it is. I think everyone is curious about everything that's affordable um, because here's why. This is why, okay? Um, so I once had somebody, I don't remember the person specifically. It might have been a viewer. I don't remember. Somebody said guitar players love cheap guitars. It's uh, At least they do on YouTube is what they said. I don't know what's being the freaking quotes today. So anyways, at least they do on YouTube. And... Um, I said, I don't think that's true. I think every guitar player is curious about affordable guitars, amps, and pedals. It gets you more curious. Here's why. This is my theory. So this is, now remember, this is coming from someone who's created a hundred million views of this content, okay? So I'm giving you that only for this reason. I want you to at least understand how I'm seeing it because I watch probably, there's probably not a single one of you that watches more YouTube than me. <laughs> so I'm wa so I'm watching YouTube a lot. I watch all the channels you watch. I like, I like said, if I have any time, I'm listening to it. Uh, when I was flying on my vacation, six hour flight each direction, it was all downloaded YouTube content. I am fully up to date on YouTube content right now. Um, each way, way I was watching and listening to that. So I've seen what you guys have seen, but a lot of you have not created what I've created. So let me just give you a perspective on this. No one is really that curious if a $3,000 guitar is any good because your assumption is it's good. <laughs> like if we were to say here, like not, most of us are not going to be uh, car people, right? So uh, like no one's going, hey, is a $200,000 sports car any good? <laughs> You're assuming it's good. It's, I mean, is it worth $200,000? Well, half of that question has more to do with you than it does with the car, right? I don't have $200,000 to buy a car, so uh, I don't think it's worth it because I don't have it. It would mean I'd have to work half my life, sell all my crap to have this car. I don't know. It'd have to be pretty amazing. But so that's not really the question, right? So in other words, when you see high-end gear, you know, oh, this is amazing. You're like, yeah, it's, it's $4,000. Of course it's good. But you're really curious. Like I said, I think musicians, I think everybody is, period, just people in general are curious about cheap stuff inexpensive stuff. Is it any good? Because you're curious to see, did I overspend? That's a big, that's a, that's a serious question, right? Um, you know, did I have to spend a thousand dollars for this? Am I, am I, you know, I bought a $300 pedal. Now somebody's saying the best pedal is a hundred dollars. Am I, am I spending too much? Should I learn more? And how many times have you guys seen where learning stuff is better than buying stuff? That is always the case. Um, you know, uh, you know, you can buy the best camera, but if you don't know how to use it, it doesn't even matter. You know, when I started my YouTube channel and I was using my phone and I got did all these videos, everybody's like, oh, buy better cameras. Half the people were wrong. They were like, just buy cameras, buy better cameras. I didn't apply my own gear logic for my music life to my video life. So I would buy expensive cameras and the videos weren't much better. It's because it wasn't the cameras. It was the lighting. I wasn't, I wasn't lighting the rooms correctly. In fact, I wasn't lighting the rooms at all. I didn't even know lighting was a thing. I just opened the window. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's where this light comes in, the window. <laughs> and so I would film during the day when the sun was the brightest coming through the window. And then one day I learned, I, I watched a video and I learned about lighting and I bought a, at that time, I think it was $89 set of lights 
that literally this is I can I'll never forget this as long as I live. I put out the video and the comments were a landslide of, oh, Phil, the new camera looks amazing. I'm like, no, no, it's my old camera. It's new lights. Yeah. <laughs> it's the new, lighting was the key. So same thing with gear. So if you if you you can learn how to use it a little better, learn to use it properly, it's going to serve you better. But also, I think we're super curious about inexpensive stuff to see if it's any good, and also that helps us figure out, uh, you know, a gauge of 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 basically when that better stuff comes along, how much how much better is it? Because in most cases, we know it's not not a big not a big difference. So that's, so like I said, I like your question, but I like I said, that's my take on it is like, yeah, everybody's curious on an expensive gear, not only because it fits into most people's budgets, but even people, the, re, the reason I say that is from my experience, very few people, let's say that you have a budget, your high end budget is $600 for guitar. Let's just say $600 is your high end. Okay. So just whether you're there way above that, way below that, I don't care. I just want you to imagine it with me for a second. You're, if you see a guitar five ninety nine, that's stretching your budget. You might go for it, but that's stretching your budget. In my experience, very few people will watch my video of a three thousand dollar guitar that only spend six hundred dollars and below on guitars. However, I see constantly three thousand people who buy three thousand dollar guitars will constantly watch nothing but two hundred dollar videos because they're, that's what they're trying to figure out. They're trying to figure out like, am I a sucker? What's going on here? <laughs> right? Because again, it's back to that $200,000 car. I'm not in the market for that. But if I hear that there's a new pick, like if Toyota came out with a new pickup truck tomorrow, that's $19,999. I would be super curious to know if what, what, you know, what, what it was, because obviously Toyota is a quality company that, you know, obviously I like small pickup trucks and I'm like, wow, 20 grand for a pickup truck. That's insane. Can it be any good? Right? So same thing. So there you go. That's kind of my thought process on that. So all I did is exchange your word that says that you said guitar players like to guitar players are curious. I think guitar players are curious about inexpensive gear. And that's why I say that because yes, some guitar players like inexpensive gear, but even guitar players who like expensive gear are curious about an expensive gear, inexpensive gear. And very rarely have I seen the opposite be true where guitar players who are into inexpensive gear are, are uh, curious about expensive guitar gear. They're not curious because <laughs> they've either decided it's not worth it or it doesn't matter anyways because it's not in your budget. Again, it's like that crazy car scenario. I, I'm, I'm not going to buy it. Even if I had the money, I'm not buying it. So why look at it? So that's, that's my thoughts. Um, <laughs> Tom says, wait, I need to add lights to my guitar to sound better. You do actually. <laughs> Actually, then then you get to find out the next thing. The lights make all your gear noisy, and you have to figure that out. So, uh, let's see. Um, uh, I th I have I always mess up your name. It's L E T H. So it's like Leith Leith. I'm gonna go like that. It says any photographer worth their salt knows lighting is everything. Great. I never did photography before. So think about this. When I did YouTube, I didn't even own a camera or a computer. <laughs> well, I mean, I had the store, I had one, but at home I didn't have a computer because I didn't want to have a computer. So I did YouTube for a couple years with no camera and no computer because uh, uh, didn't this didn't didn't know what they were or care about them at the time. So yes, you're absolutely right. But that's my whole point, isn't it? Is that if you have. Um, if you want something new, like a chunky Les Paul style neck, um, I would go with the Zach Myers. So, all right. <laughs> they said they lost the feed for a, a minute. So you guys should see me now. Yeah, I saw it was kind of hesitating. Gotta love it when it's, when the internet's crashing. Okay, so let's do some, let's hit some more questions. Uh, Lit Bay, thank you for the super chat. Louis says, hey, new guitar day, PRS SE hollow body two with the piezo. It has a small finish crack where the neck meets the body along the straight part of the joint. Looks like glare in the photos. How can I make sure it's not only, oh, how can I make sure it's only cosmetic? Okay, so there's a small finish crack where the neck meets the body. All right. Obviously, I'm not looking at it, so I mean, it's a tough thing for me to kind of tell you if it's 
cosmetic only. However, it is very possible um, that where the neck meets the body on the guitar, there could be a flex and then you would get a hairline crack. So it's not uncommon for that to be a finish crack, but I, I mean, I can't see it. And even if I could see it, I would only be looking at photos. That's something you definitely uh, want to have checked out. I, I would have that checked out, but just listening to what you said, it doesn't sound like a huge deal because like I said, it's very common to have a finish uh, crack there. That's a common place where the neck joint is. So there you go. Um, and one thing you can do very lightly is hold the body and take the headstock and kind of push on it. Like I said, lightly, you're just trying to get the neck to flex a little bit. You'll see the strings barely move. If you flex it, you can see if it opens up or not. If it doesn't open or change at all, then it's probably in the finish. But if it's in the in the wood, you'll see it open dramatically. Also, when you push on it, if you see it start to you know, move, stop. <laughs> so that's, again, a little hard to do verbally, but that's what I would recommend. Uh, I have no idea. Thorough or something. All right. That's the closest you can get today with you. Uh, it says, uh, do revert, revert, revert. See how you already threw me down with this. Uh, what they want to know is reverse wound, reverse polarity pickups. Okay, so like for, for some of you guys who understand, most likely you will connect it to the center pickup of your Stratocaster is uh, the magnets are uh, the, the going in a different direction and the wire is uh, the ground and the hot are in uh, starting at different different points, right? So you start, so they reversed. Um, he wants to know... Do they sound different than normal pickups? No, not that I, I mean, no. I mean, I wouldn't notice it. Uh, I've never really noticed anything uh, by itself in any of the positions. So in other words, if you do that and put it in any of the positions by itself would no, have uh, no sound difference. Of course, once you interact with another pickup, yes, it has a massive difference in sound. Uh, so it's really, that's really what it's about more than anything else. It's not what it sounds like by itself, but how it interacts with another pickup. So he's basically saying he wants to put a rails pickup style pickup in the bridge. Um, and he wants to sing, swap that for the single coil. But the next single coil is reverse wound. Why is the neck reverse wound, reverse polarity, not the middle? That doesn't make any sense. So sounds to me like your pickups are in the wrong spots anyways. So you need to take the neck pickup that's reverse wound, reverse polarity and put it in the center. Because here's why what the humbucker, once you put the blade in, it's not going to be an issue. So in other words, if you're, it won't be an issue, but it's going to be an issue with that having, I guess, I guess, no, I, I like, I like my idea the best. It's what I would probably suggest is put the reverse wound pickup in the center, leave the regular pickup in the neck and then put their mini humbucker in the bridge. That's how I would do it. So I would swap those two. Um, and I wouldn't even care if technically, let's say the, the reverse wound has a higher output than the, than the center pickup. Now, I don't even care about that stuff. I would, I would rather have a lower output pickup or something with more resistance in the neck, but have the reverse wound and reverse, reverse polarity in the middle. That's ideally where I'd want that. It's just going to be a lot easier. It's going to be a lot easier down the way, a long way down the road is what I would do. Swap those. Uh, Pablo says, hey, Phil, to, vet, to Phil and the vets, thank you for your service. Phil, what is a song or solo that you could, couldn't could play or learn? Well, obviously, there's tons and tons of stuff I couldn't play or learn. Um, but, uh, you know, what's interesting, uh, let's think about that for a second. Because, I mean, I could just sit there and go, oh, I could never learn this solo and I could never learn this song. Um, but what I've... What I've found to be the hardest for me is when I can't really dice, can I get along with the rhythm of something. Um, obviously speed is a thing, right? So obviously if I technically don't have speed in my fingers, I can't play fast solos and stuff. I can't do that stuff. But um, that's something I'm sure if you just kept practicing, practicing, maybe you could get there, right? Um, if you had the desire to be faster. But I've in my in my travels of learning and playing music, the bigger problem for me has always been the rhythm of something, the feel of something. Um, as a bass player, let me tell you ta as a bass player, the hardest thing I ever learned was bossa nova. 
And it was really tough for me mentally because to me, this, you know, my real first experience with a bossa nova was like a bossa nova sound on a keyboard. You know, that was my first time hearing it, you know, that style of music. And, you know, it came across so easy <laughs> to your ear, to my ear. The bass player was not playing anything very intricate. You know, to me, I'm like slapping, popping, you know, right, tapping, you know, and, <laughs> and a bossa nova. But the rhythm of a bossa nova was hora horrific, horrific for me. I was going to say horrific, horrific. Um, there's a staccato in it that is very hard to to get. And um, my bass teacher for so I, I have gone to different bass teachers throughout throughout my life. Um, Mario is my was my bass teacher for Bossa Nova, and Mario's from Chile, and um, and uh, so he taught me Bossa Nova, and he was an amazing uh, player, um, and um, he he uh, the reason I say it was hard was here he was the first person to ever teach me anything where I didn't hear what he was telling me that one was wrong. So what I mean by that is I've had the experience I think a lot of you guys can relate to. You play something and it's it's bad. <laughs> You're doing something bad, right? You're like you play a you know, play a chord a change or you play a solo or you play something and you go, oh, messed up. You go to bend and it's flat. Oh, you do the thing and it's not right. Uh, the bossa nova was the first thing where I would play it and I go, ha, ha and he go, wrong. And I'm like, no, I, I played it and I would play it. And he's like, no. And then he would play it and it, and it was just this little, like little staccato thing, you know, <laughs> I can't even do it with my mouth. And, you know, I love Paul Gilbert's theory. If you can hum it, you can play it. I love that. And in bass, the same thing. Um, you know, if you can say it, you know, if you can hum it on, you know, you can play it on the bass. And even that, that little, that little, I like to almost think of it like a hiccup. It's so quick. And the way you do it with your finger, and it was just really, really problematic for me. And this is what happened next. That was really crazy. When I did eventually get it right, I would get it wrong from the fear of getting it wrong. So even when I got it right, and he was like, okay, you got it, <laughs> right? Um, the I would then go to do it, and every time I do it, I was so scared of doing it wrong that I would mess it up. <laughs> Not because I couldn't do it, because like I said, just this anticipation of the mistake. It was very, very crushing for me. Um, and especially in that scenario, because, you know, obviously Mara was a fantastic bass player, amazing a musician. Um, and he had perfect pitch, which is like a double whammy, right? So he's an amazing musician with perfect pitch who obviously can play this stuff. Um, and, um, and, uh, but I could technically, I could play a lot of stuff he could play. Technically, I could play some of the slap stuff he could play, some of the jazzy stuff he could play. I mean, I could play some of the stuff he could play. Um, he was better musician than me, I, especially as a, as a circle, right? Basically doing all the styles. But I mean, I could I could hold water with him for, for some of the stuff he was doing. And so to be so inept and not be able to get close to that one technique. Um, and to this day... I, I like I said right now, I bet you if I was to pick up a bass and try to do it, I would do it wrong. M one, because I haven't practiced in a while. And two, because again, my anticipation of me messing it up always makes me mess it up the first time. And then the second time I go, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that was the wrong way. Let me do the right way again. And so there there was a, that was, that was the thing. It was great. Um, so I, that's what I found is that rhythms, I think, can be the hardest things to get because... Um, it's almost like you can't practice your way out of them. <laughs> I mean, you do, because essentially you practice your way out of everything. But with rhythms, sometimes you just never get that feel right. You always get it close. You know, like I like a, like I have a joke, and I, I've heard it. I heard a joke once, and I regurgitate all the time, which is I can fake anything for 15 seconds, right? Um, same thing with, you know, instrument, you know, somebody will go, Oh, you play pretty good jazz. Or you play this. And I go, yeah, I can fake that for 15, you know, 15 seconds. I can fake any kind of riff for 15 seconds. Um, that's definitely a music store kind of mentality thing, right? The customer wants you, you to play something real quick to see, cause they want to hear a guitar and you play something and they go, Oh, you play that really good. And they would, they would have listened for the next 15 seconds. It'd be a horrible 15 seconds. Um, but, uh, but man, the rhythm stuff can just be brutal. <laughs> 
<laughs> because it's more than just the practice of it. It's like, in, it's a feel thing. It's really crazy. So, um, so there you go. I hope that answers your question. And now I know uh, this weekend I'm going to be doing it all weekend. <laughs> Cause I'm like, yeah, it's been a while since I practiced that. Um, but also too, I think it was traumatic for me because I didn't go in thinking it was going to be a difficult thing. Like I said, I thought it was going to be easy. You know, the bossa nova to me when I heard it had a very like, like country music, like swing, you know, very, you know, doom, 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 you know, kind of like, okay, I know where to land the notes. I know where, to, you know, this is, you know, not a lot going on here. This is going to be good. And it just, oh, it just dis destroyed me emotionally and physically for a while. <laughs> so there you go. Um, we have, uh, Mike wants to know, what does Mike want to know? He says, do you know what ohm rating for the Amplified Nation 212 cabinets is? No info, info on their site. I think there's no information on their site because you would you would call them or email them and let them know what speakers you want. And I think you can pick the ohms with them. Um, they don't, um, I'm pretty sure unless they have something sitting around, um, they don't have anything sitting around. They build those cabinets a spec. So you can get the 212 in 16 or 8 ohms uh, without any issues. I don't think that's going to be a problem. So you can choose. Um, as I've I've reviewed a bunch of their amplifiers, all their amplifiers do for 16 or 8, so it won't matter anyways because the, their heads can accommodate whatever cabinet. So you don't have to worry about what cabinet. Um, in my experience with the 212 cabinet, um, these are the two things that, that matter to me, okay? Um, the 8 ohm cabinet and the 16 ohm cabinet is, um, I prefer 16 ohm cabinets for everything. Okay. Um, I have 8 ohm 112s, I have 8 ohm 212s, but I prefer 16 ohm cabinets, uh, whether 112 or 212, um, because I play quieter and I found that I can, the 16 ohm cabinets, um, to me, do what I want at a lower volume. Okay. So, one of the main reasons back in the day, okay, one of the main reasons we used to care about 16 eight and four ohm cabinets is that essentially we can get more out of the amp with the lower resistance. Okay. So a four ohm 212 cabinet, given all things being evil equal. So let's say we have two 50 watt speakers in a cabinet. We're going to talk 212s for a second. If two 212 or a 212 cabinet that's rated at, let's say 50 watts, 25 watts each, or let's say a 50 watts each, we'll do it hundred watts. Keep it easy, right? The if you took that exact cabinet, 100 or 100 watt cabinet, 212, and we we wired it up so that each cabinet was at four ohms, six, eight ohms, and 16, which you're going to order, you would get the amp to be a slightly louder, or yeah, it would be slightly louder at four than it was at eight, than it was 16. And more importantly, especially when we're talking about overdrive and distortion, that amp will distort more because it's got more resistance, right? So you can drive the amp harder. Okay. Do you understand? So it's 16 ohm, same cabinets, those same speakers, just wired up differently, different, uh, different ohms. The 16 ohm cabinet will distort a little bit more than the four ohm, right? So a little bit more than the eight, the eight, a little bit more than the four and the four will be slightly a little bit louder. Um, now when we talk about decibel meters, I don't know how much on the decibel meter is going to come up, but it, it'll pre be perceived as much, it'll be perceived louder. Trust me. It'll, you'll feel it in the room. I can tell you. Um, so back in the day, everyone's goal was to get the resistance down, which is why guitar players like two 412s, right? Because then you can drop the two 16, four, 16 ohm 412s, two of those, get it down to eight ohms. Same thing, right? Get two eight ohm cabinets down to four ohms, get the amp louder. Because, I mean, it's like it's almost like it was like that was the goal for decades until one, I almost feel like one day was like, <laughs> everything stops and then the goal isn't to be loud anymore the goal is to be quiet <laughs> and it wasn't you know i always hear people talking about bedroom players like it's because everybody's bedroom players and that's what started the small amp re revolution it did don't get me wrong that's a huge part but imagine what happened simultaneously how could you how could you not like how could anyone predict this craziness right um the craziness is sure everybody starts getting a little older you know the garage band falls apart you end up getting a real job, whatever that means. I don't know. I just remember the first time I got a job and somebody goes, oh, you got a real job. I'm like, <laughs> so anyways, um, 
And uh, so you, you quit the band, you get a real job, and you're playing at home now, and of course you want to turn down. That happens. But simultaneously, real musicians, or in other words, musicians that are still out there trying, they were being forced to turn down too. You know, um, the clubs wanted the volume down, the bars want the volume down, the, the casinos wanted the volume down. Um, it just became a thing. You know, no one wanted blaring music. It's just how things change, you know. Um, so, I mean, obviously some bands are still loud and you can still be loud, especially the metal genres for sure. But as a whole, everything got quieter. So with cabinets, that's kind of like why I prefer 16 ohm cabinets. So, but with the Amplified Nation, you can pick. So, and I bet you if you reach out to them, Taylor will tell you, the owner will tell you what he prefers, what ohms he prefers. He'll give you suggestion. He's very, very, always hands-on and, and, um, and uh, always helpful with that those kind of questions. Um, with my Amplify Nation cat I amps, I ran them both eight ohms and sixteen, and I didn't really have any problem because, like I said, but they get so they can get so loud so quick, and even clean that I'm never tapping anything close to <laughs> what they can do, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, Clan of House Cats says, got my 2002 Gibson 68 reissue Les Paul Custom back. That's awesome. That's exciting. It's exciting. It's not a new guitar day, right? It's a new old guitar back today. Okay. Grumpy Mike Guitar says, uh, for the Tone Jar and why not, I have a Spark Amp and the Spark Mini. Are there any compelling reasons I should go for the Spark Go as well? So I have a video of the Spark Go. So I don't have my Spark amp anymore, as like I as like I as I told you guys. I really like the way it sounded, but um, my presets got erased or something, and then the app wouldn't let me edit the presets unless I did their download. And I had to plug it in a computer. <laughs> I, I've told this story already. It, look, I'm not proud of the story, but it's what happened. Uh, I plugged. I turned on my amp, my, I lost my presets, something happened and I go, okay, I went into the app on my phone to just edit up some new presets. And it said I needed a firmware update and I had to plug my amp into a computer and the computer was in the other room and I didn't want to do it. <laughs> and so months and months went by of me not playing the amp because I, I kept telling myself I would do it, but I just didn't have time and I have something else I can play constantly. So I didn't do it. So eventually I just got rid of the spark. Um, so I didn't, I just want to let be clear. I didn't want to get rid of it because of the way I didn't get rid of it for the way it sounded. I got rid of it because of the issue. And I like to point out that people constantly put on that video and send me messages that spark is not very supportive of customers. They wouldn't even talk to me. So don't, I, I don't know what to tell you guys. I totally feel for your pain. <laughs> okay. Uh, I reached out to them too with issues and I never got responses back. So I don't know if the person that handled social media isn't there anymore. Or I don't know. Maybe they hate me. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, so to answer that question, um, that's why I got rid of the Spark. Um, I got the Spark Go because you guys kept asking about that and the Mini. The Mini is has no purpose in my in my needs, uh, any of my needs. I don't need a small little cube size amp um, at all. However, um, I did want a little travel amp and I've been taking the Black Star and the Black Star is kind of big. And so when I go on a plane, as I've said before in a video, I usually use a iRig plugin or some kind of plugin in my laptop. And um, I'm trying not to bring my laptop anymore. I'm trying not to bring any technology with me. I got to bring my phone and that's about it. Um, the uh, I've said this before, you know, my wife is very uh, determined when we go on vacations to try to find places that don't even have Wi-Fi anymore because I spend my life on the internet. I make my living on the internet. And so you know, to get, to get me to stop working, you got to get me away from the internet. So, uh, which is very hard to do. So, um, I got the spark go. And, um, so the question is if you have the spark, was that the question? You have the spark mini and you have spark amp that to me there, to me, and I've not played the spark mini. So I kind of, I have to do this. I'm just calculating to me, the spark mini and somebody correct me in the comments if I'm totally off base here that have both. Um, to me, the Spark Mini, to me, is just a small version of the Spark, right? It's just like half the size. So if you're, and it's battery powered. Okay, I got that. So it's portable battery powered and it's smaller Spark. The Spark Go to me is a totally different animal. It's the most impressive thing I've bought in years. 
Uh, I bought it. Uh, so, so you guys know I have a video. I don't want to kind of like let it all the secrets out, but I did a video and I did it a little differently. I didn't learn anything about it. I took it with me in a box. I'm kind of telling too much already. Amazing. I got nothing but good things about the Spark Go, and they're on sale right now for 109. So if you don't want to watch my video, I guess it comes out Monday or whatever. <laughs> if you don't want to watch my video, the sum up is you should definitely buy one for 109 bucks. I would have bought one after playing it. I would have bought it for 200 bucks. I I bought mine for 129.99, okay, plus uh, tax it was 139, but then it went on sale and I got 20 dollars refunded back to me because I emailed my Sweetwater salesperson and said, hey. You guys put it on sale like two days after I bought it. <laughs> Can I get a, a discount or you know a partial refund? And they said, yeah, um, it's really cool. However, if you're asking me if it sounds as good as the bigger ones, no, it's it's not about how it sounds. You play it so quiet. It's a, like I said, it's a totally different thing. So uh, it's a totally different animal. Um, I don't know how to explain it. It's like if you just want a little teeny Bluetooth speaker that fits in your hand and I mean, it's cool. And it fits in the front pouch of your gig bag. I mean, it was just in, you know, um, so it's, it's my go-to thing probably for our, all kinds of, you know, wanting him in a play or something. It's great. So, and it, I don't know the mini, I don't know how long it lasts, uh, for hours wise, but the spark go, I was playing and we, we had it going for five hours. It says it goes eight to 10. I don't know how long it goes, but I had it going for five hours. Let me just put it this way. Every time I turned it off, it's because we were sick of it before it was tapped out. So it goes for a long time. So Spark Go is great uh, for the for the price. Great. And dummy proof if you don't like apps and all that stuff. It's, it's easy. So, um, and so to, uh, part of your other question is, I'm sure because you have those two amps, do you ever, the only reason you don't need the Spark Go. So in other words, should you get the Spark Go as well? Only if you're going to go somewhere. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't, no, I mean, I'm sure the mini does everything the Go does and it sounds probably better and you can Bluetooth and all that stuff at your house. But I was specifically want something that's like goes, you know, in the front pouch of my gig bag uh, with a little cable and it was perfect. Um, plus, I don't have to bring a Bluetooth speaker with me wherever I go. So it was a double whammy. Uh, CS says, hey, so Phil, what are your thoughts on Slash leaving Marshall and going to Magnetone? So I saw the article on that, as you guys know. So if, if, for those of you who don't know, Slash has left Marshall. Now there's some, some I want to uh, also tell everybody, I read two articles uh, that I think were the same article, but one rehashed, right? I may have missed it. I try to read it again. But after I got the gist of it, you know, my attention span kind of narrowed off. I don't remember reading that he's not with Marshall. Uh, that's a sense I got. I just got the sense that he, I just got that he's with Magnetone. So I think that's where I saw it. I read Magnetone's thing and then I read the thing on Guitar World or whatever. So he's definitely with Magnetone. There's no question there. The question I have, just a small one, is is he totally gone and done with Marshall? I didn't see uh, anything that says he's done with Marshall. However, I did notice that he was playing some amps uh, a while back and they had no logos on them and no logos on the cabinets, which, I, which is weird, right? Weird thing to say. So what does this mean? Uh, it doesn't mean anything. It's John Mayer is not with Fender anymore, right? And, uh, you know, uh, Zach Wilde's not with Gibson. He's with Wild Audio. Uh, I think this is how it's going to go. You know, um... It's really interesting. I, I've i told you guys, I don't want to sit here and just, you know, con pontificate crap constantly. Um, I, want to, I want to be able to give some insight. And one of the things that's always been tough for me on the channel is, you know, obviously when you have guitar repair questions or, you know, stuff about how to run a store or things like that, or, you know, um, I could always give some insight because I did it long enough, you know, that... It wasn't just me going, this is what I think. I can go, hey, man, I have my hands. I've fixed over, I've fixed thousands, thousands of guitars. So let me tell you what my experience with, with that is. And whether I'm wrong or right, which I can still be both, at least it's founded on something. And so as I've done YouTube for the last few years, you guys have seen, like I started, you know, with the, the Badlands guy and started a guitar company. I've, 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 I've went on stage and played in front of 80,000 people and then played again in front of 30,000 people, whatever. Any experience I can grab, because this is the show. It's, hey, let's talk about these things. And can I add 
any insight to it that would be helpful. So ironically, I, I did that deal with uh, Kiesel Guitars where we made the, the Copper Penny Delos. And I told you guys that that's one of the things I was very interested in is what's the experience, you know, what can I, and I can tell you guys like, you know, oh yeah, this is why he left Marshall and this is why they probably did this and we can all guess. But I worked with companies, so let me give you some insight that might help you with Slash and it's not to tell you exactly what happened with Slash, but it might give you some insight. So as you guys know, I have a deal with Kiesel Guitars. They make this thing called the PM Delos. It's uh, it's a Delos with my color and my wire, wiring schematic and stuff on that. As I've already disclosed to you guys that I don't receive any any financial benefit um, from you buying those guitars. My arrangement with Kiesel is very simple. Um, if I dream up some guitars and we, it works, makes sense to work together, they'll send me a guitar and they won't charge me for it. And I don't receive a benefit financially to you buying the guitar. That's important because it lets me, one, learn about the entire process of being a signature type artist with a company, but also it doesn't make me have to worry about selling guitars to you guys. In my opinion, uh, not my opinion, in my preference, I don't care what Kiesel you guys buy. I like Kiesel, so if you guys want to support Kiesel, buy whatever you want. Uh, I, it helps them, and and at the end of the day, like I said, they benefit no matter what what you buy, whether you buy the thing with that's associated with me or not. However, what I didn't disclose, and maybe this is a perfect time, is Kiesel was not the only company to ever come to me about a signature situation uh, working together with guitar. And... Uh, and that actually was important because um, I've had other companies, and I'm not going to sit here and bash the other companies because it's it it would it, it just it's not not going to do it. I will tell you though what I learned from this experience, the experience of interacting with companies. A lot of companies, um, as I've said before, are people. And it's not about, maybe the focus right now with Marshall is they got bought by a bigger company. As you guys know, they got, Marshall got bought. We've talked about this on the podcast before. The important things to know right now is Marshall was bought like a year or two ago and they were bought by the company who was making their Bluetooth speakers. And there was a lot of theories out there that what was going to happen is, you know, the company was going to basically just do only import stuff and basically use the Marshall name to sell more refrigerators and refrigerator cell phone ca cases and all that stuff. And it's probably somewhat, there's some truth in that for sure. And then of course now Slash leaving, which is Slash. I mean, come on. When you think Marshall, you think Slash, you think ACDC. Like there's probably, like I don't even think Van Halen is associated to Marshall as much as Slash because Van Halen took the, the logos off the cabinets, took the, the damn screens off the cabinets. You know, Slash is a Les Paul top hat and a Marshall Stack silhouette. I mean, he is their image. They're ingrained heavily together. Um, so it's crazy to see him leave. So here's what's interesting to, is this. Um, I had companies and I would talk to them and I'd say the same thing. I want this guitar. I want to make videos with it. I don't necessarily want a signature guitar or anything. I just want this guitar to make videos. And so you know, these videos end up accumulating millions of views over time throughout the, all the videos. And there's a benefit to you to do this. And it was always shocking to me to see how companies really could not take a free gift of, I will get you millions of views in front of guitar players. I will get $0 for it. And I never even asked for a guitar for free. None of these companies have ever asked me, ever did I tell them, this Copper Penny Mattel, I never told them they got to give me the guitar for free. I was more than willing to pay for it. Of course, I always said, hey, if you have an accommodation pricing or something, you know, you're going to make me a deal. That'd be great because I'm going to sell guitars for you. I just want something I it can help me make content. And by the way, if as I make this content, people are going to see it and we're all guitar players and we're all, you know, we're all nerds and we all love guitars and, and there might be somebody who wants one too. How many companies were like, we want to work with you. We want to do it, but it's got to be this guitar. It's got to be this thing. It's got to be that thing. All of a sudden, I was shocked. I was like, what, what, I don't understand this. I'm giving you free marketing. Free. <laughs> it's free. What? Why is there rules for me when I have no rules for you? What is the, what's the incentive here? Just take the easy, right? Take the easy situation. So here's the thing with um, Slash. It could be there is trouble with Marshall. Maybe he doesn't like them, but maybe Magnetone was the company who said the right things. Um, look at somebody so simple as Steve I. You know, Steve I's been 
his story has always been that these companies all courted him in the uh, mid 80s to have a signature guitar and they all wanted him to have a signature guitar but everybody just really wanted to force their guitar down his throat and Ibanez was the first company basically like what do you want and he goes I want you to make this for me and they made it that's his story now without the hindsight of that story he could just be shoveling crap like anybody else but now we can go 40 years later 35 years later he's still playing the exact same guitar. So the story kind of checks out a little bit if you think about this, right? He says, make me what I want and I'll play it all the time. I I, I did the same thing with the Delos. I said, make me what I want and I'll play it all the time. And they did and I played it all the time, right? It, it's, it wasn't about, oh, I can get 3% or 5% of everyone who buys one of these. It's just like It's just like that situation. It's like, that's not what it's about. It's just like you guys. Hey, if you had the opportunity, I mean, think about this. I want you guys to think for a second, whether it's a YouTube channel or it's a, you know, you're an artist, whatever. If you got a, if you got an opportunity in your life to sit with a company that you respect and like, and you love their products and you have some kind of value that you can come to them and say, make me what I dream about. And if you do that, I'll play it. Of course you'll play it. Cause I mean, that, that's like your, your dream to have this, this, this thing. And, um, and so same thing with Slash. I'm really I'm really interested to know if it's somewhat it's not that he left Marshall as that Magnavox. No, why am I saying Magnavox? Magnetone, sorry. Magnetone. Maybe they just came at the right way and said, Why don't we make you what you want? Why don't we do what you want? Why don't, you know, we just want, you know, <laughs> because he's a great get, man. That there are few guitar players that can sell product like Slash vi halen i mean look i as i've you know I've, I've told you guys my favorite guitar player in the world is monty montgomery monty's amazing but like i said he doesn't sell a whole lot of gear <laughs> right he's not you know he's not selling a lot of pedals and amps and stuff right um some guitar players they are great guitar players and then some guitar, guitar players are great guitar players who just have this ability to get us all inspired to buy stuff you know right buy their guitars buy their amps buy whatever they're doing so I think it's crazy. What I'm really shocked to see was, or shocked, what am I, what am I say? What I'll be really shocked and, and curious about is how much does he level up Magnetone? Like, I, I don't know. It's it's interesting to me. It's an interesting, interesting thing. This This is a big deal. I think this is the biggest thing I've ever kind of witnessed i think all of us have witnessed in that kind of level like when Sla uh when zach wild left gibson i was i think we were all a little like whoa that's crazy <laughs> right um eddie leaving pv wasn't a shocker or leaving uh you know music man didn't really shock people didn't send anything uh you know shock waves through um i'm trying to think john Mayer leaving fender wasn't even a big deal you know at the time you're like oh okay left fender <laughs> right it's not a big deal because John Wayne, you know, our John Wayne, John Mayer, when he left Fender, we, we already know, we already seen him playing other things. Slash is a Gibson Les Paul and a Marshall Stack. What's really interesting, uh, does anyone, anyone thought about this? When I heard that uh, Slash left Marshall, or he's no longer with Marshall, the first thing I thought about was Mesa Boogie. I was like, oh, this is genius. This is going to be Gibson. I was like, I almost thought for one second, Gibson had somehow like master planned out the next 10 years. I was like, oh, this is ingenious. They buy Mesa Boogie and everybody's like, okay, Mesa Boogie, which I love and I have, but I mean, it's definitely like you think of metal when you think Mesa Boogie. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, if they, Mesa Boogie comes out with a Marshall style amplifier, which they have some already, but you know, one specifically with Slash and now they have a Slash Les Paul with Gibson and the Slash Mesa Boogie, right? Remember, he was a brand ambassador for Gibson. So I'm mean, like, this totally makes sense. And then when I saw his magnetone, I go, oh, wow, that's a, like a little curveball. I was like, I didn't, you know, because magnetone's great amps. I've played a bunch. Uh, we've talked about on the show. They're great amps. Uh, they're expensive, but they're great. But they're just not a huge amp company size-wise. You know, they're expensive and they're boutique and they're beautiful, but they're not like volume. So it'll be interesting. So really crazy congratulations to all you guys who have slash marshall amplifiers that are now going to double in price um so oh, enjoy those until you feel the desire to uh uh now brian says magnetone dump truck a cash slash now here's what's interesting 
I would say one of two things right now. If they did, good for them because he's worth every penny they give him. Every single penny. Okay? Um, even if they had to give him half their company, it was probably a good deal. Okay? That would probably not be the deal I, I would hope they would do. Um, but if they had to go get a loan and to level up and get him on board, uh, that was a smart move for them. But I... I don't know, and you don't know either. We don't know. We're guessing. I, My gut instinct, again, working with these companies, so many of these companies behind the scenes in some degree, I bet you they gave him what he wanted because he doesn't need a dump truck full of cash. You know, believe it or not, Eddie Van Halen, a lot of people accuse Eddie Van Halen when he's the EVH brand as a cash grab. It wasn't a cash grab. I, I don't believe that to this day. I don't believe it. I didn't believe it then. I believe what the guys that I know at EVH have said, and they've said consistently, which was he had exact, he knew exactly what he wanted, how he wanted it. And he basically didn't want to be told what to do. I think the same thing with John Mayer and, and PRS. I think John Mayer's statement is, you know, he wants exactly what he wants. And and again, I'm going to say this. And again, I, I know this is silly to say this, but I just, again, if it gives imparts any, any insight, maybe it will. I, I'm very lucky to have this channel. I'm very lucky to have you guys as a community. And I'm very lucky the channel's gotten some, mono, you know, a little moniker of success, whatever you call it, whatever. Um, but here's the thing. Um, when I would talk to companies about maybe making a guitar, for, you know, not a signature guitar, but just a guitar for me so I could use it in videos and stuff. I'm like, hey, this would be able to work. Um, there, it wasn't from about money. It was always about exactly like if I could just get what I actually really want or need to make to do what I do and have exactly what I want, it would life would be great because I already have some nice guitars. That's, that's cool, but it's not what your, you know, your goal is. So I think, um, I think with him, I would be, I'm really believe that he's probably just, they, they kind of came together and they were like, this is a good matchup and he's doing, you know, they, and, and here's another thing. Somebody mentioned that the other guitar player in, in Guns N' Roses is playing, uh, magnetone and and that's another thing i've learned in this industry that happens a lot so the person who's the rep that the other guitar player is dealing with is probably a good person uh and i'm, I'm not kidding like he's probably a, a a decent person and 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 then slash meets him and then they they have some kind of relationship like a friendship but also an understanding of each other and they know each other and that person gets to do something that a lot of companies can't do which is a lot of companies can throw a checkbook at somebody and say hey we'll give you this money if you do this but that guy um or or that gal could have the insight to say here's slash here's what i want uh, here's what i'm gonna do for you right um the, the, I don't know if you guys saw the, the, there's like a documentary on Michael Jordan, the basketball player about how he got the shoe. And obviously they gave him, a, you know, money, <laughs> a lot of money, but they also gave him what he wanted. And that was like a huge deal. And they also would highlight him. And I think that's a, a thing. And I, I'm going to say this as a critic of gear. I've never thought Marshall appreciated any of their artists. I, I like I said, I'm a fanboy for Marshall. I will always own a Marshall. Um, I will die owning one, at least one Marshall, <laughs> um, because there's just something to me. It's in my head. It's ingrained. Um, I've said this before. I don't think my Marshalls are my best amps. I think, uh, I have so many amps that are, are better now than Marshalls. Um, I play everything but my Marshall the most, but Marshall is a, ingrained in me is a, is not only a brand, but an iconic st status symbol of music and and everything. And, um, but that being said, nothing about them, especially since Jim Marshall passed away, um, has really made me feel like they, you know, really cared about their artists. And again, I don't want you to think I'm saying that they were horrible, their artists. I'm just saying if you had Slash, <laughs> I think you would make sure he didn't go. You know what I mean? And I don't know. That's just my two cents. Uh, so hmm. that's a great comment. Albert says monopoly guy still working on that slash top hat endorsement deal. Yes. Yeah. Well, think about this. One thing I'm, I'm a huge slash fan, as you guys know. And, um, 
every time I would go see Slash Live, he had those Marshall cabinets with the the um, the trucker girls, I guess what you call it, but they had the top hats, right? The trucker girls with top hats. And I always thought, like, why isn't it a thing? Why isn't it? Why can't I buy a Marshall with those things on there? I don't understand this. <laughs> so, like, you, like I said, you'd think they lean into it. So, <laughs> all right, uh, let's see. Bird Rockin says, I actually met Jim Marshall at the NAMM show years ago. I also got to meet him uh, when he, uh, right towards the end, he was in a wheelchair. Super nice. I didn't have a YouTube channel. Funny enough, I I talked to him for a little while. He was super, super nice. He told me some stories that were great and hilarious and interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, he was amazing. Like I said, it's, it's, I mean, the company, I mean, it's to me, it's a, it's like a Marshall to me is like it's Fender, it's Gibson, it's this just this history. It's part of the the music world, the guitar world. You know, it's everything. Um, and like I said, and I I don't dislike anything about their amps and stuff. I just think people have modified and made some better products now that that fit my needs better. And Marshall didn't really see that as not you know they didn't care. They didn't care to keep guitar players like me interested in their stuff. They just kept rehashing their old stuff. Maybe they will one day. Maybe they'll, like I said, um, I wouldn't be shocked if Marshall eventually makes something that, you know, they just copy Friedman amps. <laughs> That's what they kind of really do. <laughs> okay. So, um, all right. Uh, Tom says Friday cheers and thanks. All right. Still rude. Just did a super chat. Thank you. Ray says, is it ever possible to keep a Squire Strat in tune for more than one song? Of course it is. You can keep a stra Squire Strat in tune forever. Um, the principles to keeping guitars in tune have nothing to do with the brand or the... Um, uh, it's uh, Quality components are particularly problematic, right? But the design we know works. Look, the Fender design, the Strat design, okay? Let's start with the design. Works, okay? It's a, it's a, it, it works. Um, so if you have a Squire Strat, we know it's not the design, okay? The headstock works. The body shape works. The the you know the scale length works. Everything works there. Um, if it's not staying in tune, my guess is now we're going to go to especially on a Squire. You're going to be talking components because again we know the design works. Let's go from there. The thing that would be the problem next would be components. So go ahead and and you need to look at the the main problematic things for tuning on a guitar, which are going to be the nut, then the tuning keys, then the string tree, then the tremolo. I would say almost in that order is where you want to start solving problems, right? You want to make sure first the nut is cut perfectly and it's quality. Uh, then you want to make sure the tuning keys are good and their quality. And then, then check the string tree to make sure it's not hindering or harming anything going on. Um, one of the things I like to do in, with squires, by the way, typically squires, a lot of them will have two string trees. The first thing I like to do is remove the string tree to the D and the G string. I just take it off, get rid of it. Um, that works a lot of times. A lot of people put roller, uh, string trees and all kinds of stuff on there that works. Uh, also you can get the low friction ones from graph tech. Those are great too. But even then I remove the one for the, uh, G and D string, just get it out of there. <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, there's a, it, you'll have a little bit more ring when you hit chords, you'll hear those two strings ring a little bit because of, right. Um, but you can put a piece of foam underneath there if that bugs you. But I would get that out of there. That will help for tuning stability. Um, but once the nut's right, then the tuning keys are good. And then the string trees are not uh, hindering anything. Then you want to check the tremolo and make sure it's 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 working okay. Now, keep in mind, somebody's going to say, well, then go ahead and upgrade the whole guitar. This is also true. However, keep, I'm not saying you have to buy the best stuff, Right. Um, you can buy quality components. All the things I just mentioned can all be bought. To if you've got new tuning keys, a new bridge and a new nut, you can do that for a hundred, uh, less than a hundred dollars that are quality enough components. So there you go. Um, now <laughs> if the next moving and you're having issues cause of temperature or, uh, climate issues, you know, with the humidity and stuff. That's another issue, but you also didn't say what kind of squire you have. I'm assuming you just have a mid line squire. You might have a bullet. I don't know. 
but it, like I said, it is possible to keep a squire in tune uh, for months, uh, for long periods of time. Uh, Grumpy Diggis says, hey, mate. I don't know. See how bad I said? Hey, mate. Hey, mate. Thinking uh, one more acoustic opinion on the, the Maton uh, Messiah. Uh, Martin Taylor Gibson. Maton Bright. Yeah, the mate, Maton Bright. It's Maton, right? Or Maton. It's an Australian brand. Amazing guitars. Amazing. 6.5K Australian. Any help? Hmm. I like all the guitars you just said, <laughs> but I'd be silly if I didn't tell you. Like, I can't tell you what to pick. I can just tell you what I would pick. I'd get the... I want the Maiden, but same thing as you, man. I, that price is just... I can't do it. So that's why I have a tailor. <laughs> so, uh, but if I had the scratch, oh, I would go. I would go to the Maiden. Uh, Warm 5 says, New Guitar Day Squire Jazz Master is killer. Also, proud to tell you that I... Renewed my Patreon membership for another year. Thank you for all your service. Uh, thank you for your service. Oh, th th thank you so much. And thank you for sponsoring the podcast for another year. That's pretty awesome. Um, like I said, we're very lucky, uh, the patrons and the members, man. You guys not only are amazing, but you, man, that we've, the most of them have been with us since the beginning. It's crazy. I think it's like 65% of the people who started with this show as a patron member are still with us from the beginning it's crazy you guys are amazing on every level and so much thank you guys for the super chats and thank you for the thumbs up by the way thumbs ups are free you can throw some of those at you know i understand not everybody can throw money at youtube channels and stuff man there's so much there's important things you got to do with your money too trust me i understand that but you can always do a thumbs up those are free they help too they help uh, sometimes just as much um, Dave says, speaking of Marshalls, any thoughts on the original Sir Badger 30 amps? I played the Sir Badger amp. I really liked it. Um, I did not own one, so it wasn't a case of like, I got one, I didn't like it, I got rid of it. I just got to try one and I remember thinking I liked it, um, but it didn't pull the trigger. Um, so there wasn't necessarily anything, you know, like, like I said, uh, good or bad about it. Um, at the time, the one, when I wanted one, uh, it's when I didn't have anything like that. And then by the time I tried one, I already had a Friedman. And to me, the Friedman was doing what I needed to do. So that's it. Um, but I can understand, like, to me, if you went that way instead of Friedman, I don't know if there would be a huge difference. In, well, there's no difference in quality. Slight tonality difference. So it would be your, you know, kind of your taste preference to get. But for me, it was the Friedman. Let's see. Uh... Hold on. Oh, PW is saying, what about uh, Cole Clark? Cole Clark is amazing as well. I believe they're also owned by Maiden. Um, I love Cole Clark. Uh, so that's a suggestion too. Check out Cole Clark. Um, they're different though. All those guitars he mentioned are, it's not that Cole Clark's not as expensive because they're expensive. They're just not that level. To me, Cole Clark is amazing with their own, their own an animal. They have like the best acoustic sound ever. They just, they feel great. They look great. I love everything about those guitars. Like I've said before. Um, so, you know, I was, last time we brought up Cole Clark on the channel, um, the Cole Clark guys reached out. They said, hey, thanks for talking about us. And they said, if, you know, I think they asked me if I want to review anything. And I said, yes, let's do some stuff. And then I never heard from them. <laughs> it happens a lot on the channel. Companies reach out. And they go, hey, you want to do some stuff? And you're like, yeah. And then you never heard from them anyway. So they got other stuff to do. Um so, okay, you know what's on a positive little side note here. Let me go here. Okay, so let me make two quick announcements. Oh, three, cool. So I'd like to announce real quick that Matthew, Matthew responded. I can't read your email right now, Matthew, because, you know, obviously. But Matthew uh, got my email about his snarks. He won two snarks, and so did... Uh, Silvio, right? Silvio, thank you. And James, James, thank you. So three of the five people have responded. Um, we gave away 10 snarks to, to each, uh, plus a new year pick and sticker and stuff. And, uh, three of the people responded to me and we'll do more of those giveaways too coming up. I want to thank you guys for participating when we do those giveaways. And thank you guys for responding to my emails. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, let me go back to my... Okay, so another subject that came up that came in was that we didn't talk about because the slash thing got kind of overtook it was did anyone uh, anyone did anyone a bunch of people sent me a message including in the chat today did i see that tremani's new amp dropped i did the mt100 dropped which you know obviously highly anticipated for what five years now uh amp dropped and uh so i watched the tremani video on it and checking out the amp um obviously uh some of you guys might know that i interviewed him and he, and he spent the entire interview talking about that amp and what he's been going through in the design of that. If you want to see that interview, it's on the second channel. It was a really detailed discussion. It was really funny because it was like two years ago. And that was a funny interview. They, they, um, they being the management company, Mark Tremonti's management company, uh, asked me to interview him about, about his new album. And I interviewed the new, about the new album. We talked about the new album and he just spent the whole time because, you know, we're amp guys talking. Actually, you know, what happened was, I don't even know if it's in the video, but before the video started, I, he, I had some amps um, in view at that time and he saw one of the Bogners or something I had and he's like, what is that? And we started talking and he's like, oh, he's super into amps and that's kind of overtook the, the show for the amps. So we talked about his amp um, and how he's trying to get the perfect uh, sec second channel on that amp. So the Mark Tremonti 100 watt head is essentially his take on the idea of getting a, a great clean channel with a great kind of dumbly uh, mid gain channel, low mid gain channel, and then of course the high gain third channel. Um, what's nice about the amp is they're they're made uh, by Cortec. I don't know if you guys know that. So why that's important is this is important. No, the MT15 is not made by Cortec. Um, it may be eventually, but it wasn't currently. Like none of the MT MT15s that I played were made by Cortec. Um, Cortec, in my opinion, has made a, a, a tremendous strides and expense into trying to make tech. Oh, besides doing guitars. So I, I, you guys may know, Cortec now owns Digitech. Uh, and DOD. So as you guys see the Digitech and DODs come back, it's because Cortec bought them. They bought all the intellectual properties. And then they hired all the people uh, like Tom Cram who designed that stuff to come back and not only get it right, but now continue on the legacy of those of those brands. Um, so it makes total sense that Cortec would start making amps for uh, companies like Paul Reed Smith Amps. Uh, and they're also... Um, so, you know, they're in the works talking to other companies about making their amps right now, too, as well. Um, this is, I happen to know because I was talking to actually two companies who Cortec is talking about doing their line of amps, and we had a whole discussion about Cortec and what they've done. And so this is important because um, I, I like Cortec as a company. I've talked about this for many years. They make the Stramberg guitars. They make the Paul Reed Smith guitars now. Um, the owner of Cortec... Um, his, his father who started Cortec in the seventies passed away. And so he's carrying on the legacy now. And I can definitely tell, um, I, th I think there's a saying, right? Isn't there a saying about the, 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 the second generation, like levels up the company and the third generation, like ruins the company, right? So this is the second generation and they're leveling up the company, right? So hopefully the, the, the next generation, you better pay attention next generation, uh, <laughs> to Cortec. Um, because I think they really are leveling up the company and they're doing a lot of cool stuff. And, um, and so I can imagine the amps built pretty well. Because it seems like um, the new Archons are made by Cortec, and they seem built really well. And um, I can't remember if the new Sunzera was made by Cortec. I thought it wasn't. If I thought, if I'm rem rem remembering correctly, but um, then that's how they got it to eighteen hundred dollars. I know eighteen hundred dollars is a lot of money, but obviously a hundred watt head with three channels that does everything that Mark Tremonti wanted. Uh, it's just you ain't gonna get it for eighteen hundred dollars. Uh, not made in the USA. And to be honest with you, as we all know, even if it was made in the USA, it would just be assembled here with all the components that they're getting somewhere else. So why not have Cortec do it? So um, <laughs> Brian says there are zero people who need a 100 watt head. This is true. But if you've ever tried the Archon 100 watt head, you'll know that other than it being heavy, it's not a problem. So you don't need uh, 100 watt head. Well, first of all, if it's if it, you can make it 50 watts, you can pull two tubes out, two power tubes out of that Mark Tremonti amp, just like most any other amps. You have to look on a schematic to see which one. Sometimes it's one side, and sometimes it's like the, every other. You just yank two, and then you're down to 50 watts. There you go. Woohoo! Uh, <laughs> if that's something that matters to you, my guess is it's not going to matter because the amp's going to be able to get pretty quiet. 
uh, and sounds pretty good. Now, here's what I don't know. So let me give you the negatives because I have not tried the amp. So my concerns. My only, well, I have two. Two negative critiques on the MT-15. I think one MT-15 is one of the best lunchbox, amp, lunch, lunchbox amps ever made uh, at almost any price point. It's one of my absolute favorite amps. I love the overdrive. I think it sounds better than almost everything that's out there in that category. The clean on it is very good. I love the LEDs. I love the vibe. I like the amp. My only critiques, like in the video, was the feet are too short, so it wobbles when you put it on a handle, uh, a cabinet with a handle, which all my 112s have handles. That's a minor thing to complain about, but it's just something to notice. But the main thing is um, when in the gain setting, when you turn it down, all of a sudden it does what like the old Fender amps do, which is like you turn it down and you go, it's still too loud, too loud, and it's off. <laughs> and then it's like, sounds like a radio and it's on too loud. Okay. And it's off. And I just couldn't get it quite enough. And it, uh, and it has a, has a, a, a wattage switch. You can switch it down. It still doesn't help. It's just, it doesn't let you get super quiet. That super quiet. Don't disturb anybody in the house kind of sound. Um, which is something you really want from that amp. I think that's something they can fix. I think they can fix it with a new potentiometer. Um, and I don't know, you know, so if, you know, that's one thing you can do. But here's the interesting part about that amp that 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 bums me out. The MT-15. I think it's, in my opinion, slightly, sounds slightly better than the new Archon. Uh, I think the clean is just as good. I think the overdrive is just a little bit more throaty and I like it a little bit more. But the Archon can get whisper quiet. And for us, uh, you know, staying in the bedroom dudes, you kind of need that, right? It's just, it's a must have. So, I mean, you can use the um, Tremonti and you can do the uh, effects loop trick where you put an, uh, a volume pedal in the effects loop or an EQ pedal and you can lower it that way. And you can also run it clean and just run pedals through it and get it super quiet, you're fine too. But I'm really curious to know if the 100 watt head will actually get, it's funny because it might, the 100 watt head might actually get quieter than the 15 watt head because the Archon does it. Because I think, like I said, I think it's the type of potentiometer they're using for the volume pot. Um, because obviously Fender fixed that in the Hot Rod Deluxe, you know, so they're obviously, there's something to do that. But uh, other than that, I have not tried the uh, 100 watt head. Um, I have no in, uh, plans to buy one. Uh, it's an amazing amp. I'm a huge Tremonti fan, of course, right? I mean, Alter Bridge is one of my top favorite bands of all time. And, uh, and uh, you know, but still everything has to make sense to me. And sadly enough, I'm like, <laughs> it's funny. Tonight, tonight, you guys are, if you're watching this, you see my Supro head. I have a Supro Blackmagic uh, Reverb head behind me. The reason it's there is because right before the video came on, I was looking, checking my hair and my makeup, and uh, I realized there's an amp that you can't see. <laughs> so I had to grab the amp and put it over there, and, I, and then the cabinet looked weird by itself, so I put that amp there. So I have a new amp that I'm going to be reviewing soon. Um, so like I said, that's my whole thing, is I have a lot of amps, and... Um, they're all great, and uh, I don't know. If I get a chance to try the Tremonti amp, I'm, I might. Uh, obviously, I would do a video, like so if I get to borrow one from somebody or something. Um, and funny enough, I'd like, I would, I'd like to get it if I, you know, and hope that it can replace my Saldano amp. I've uh, the Saldano amp's great, but I've, I've had it now for a little while, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's cool. So, um, let's see. <laughs> Brian says, I need all the amps. Yeah, you know what's funny is, I, the, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really funny. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> we need, need all the amps. Like, just all of them. If we had all the amps, we'd be set. Um, Uh, hold on. Just looking to see if any comments about the Tremonti head. Oh, here's one from Trick or Treat AZ. He said, who made the MT-15? I don't know who made it. It was made in China, though. Uh, he was talking about the change in the in from the 6L6 to the uh, 5885s. Why is the MT-100 6L6s again? So interesting. I don't know. I'm sure we could ask Doug Sewell if we reach out. Maybe I'll send Doug an email and ask him. Um, I'm going to give you a, a, a just a generic guess. 
um, and then we'll see. Uh, I'll see if I can get the real answer for you, trick or treat, um, and see how close my guess was. The main reason they switch from six L sixes to uh, fifty eight eighty fives, um, the the only reason they switched. Okay, so we're not, we'll talk about the second part in a second. But the the reason they switched was they just couldn't get six L sixes. That six L sixes are becoming very problematic. It's very hard to come across amps now with six L sixes. Almost every amp that has that type of uh, tube in it is going to have um, uh, uh, a, a, uh, EL84s or instead of 6P6s, EL34s. EL34s, EL84s. They're switching that. It's getting hard to get in certain tubes. So when they switched from 6L6s to the 5885s, they flat out said it was because of availability. Um, in my interview with Mark Tremonti, he says that in the interview, so you know as well, very candidly says, we just couldn't get 6L6s anymore, so we had to use 5885s. Remember the two problems, or obviously remember the world was ending with COVID and then, you know, the Russian tubes, uh, Russia went to war with Ukraine and no tubes, and remember, you know, right? Um, and then it just so happened they liked the 5885s more. Interesting enough, I've... I've played both the MT-15 with the 6 l 6s yeah, and the 5885s, and I prefer the 5885s as well. Um, uh, not a huge difference, you know, not enough difference to where I would, t I could tell you, you know, if I plugged in and go, what is this? This is the 6 l 6s But when you ABM, ABM, I thought the 5885s sounded a little, a little better, a little smoother, less fizz, and a little bit more punch, just a little bit, but again, subtle. You know, I, I, to me, it's not that they sounded better. I don't think that's the, the important thing to focus on. They just, they weren't a compromise. So in other words, uh, it's what they could get. And by the way, we talked about last week, we talked about the, um, uh, we talked about the, um, the super champ X2s and how they don't make those anymore. And those had six L sixes in them. And that could be a reason why Fender got rid of them too, because it's getting pro it's getting hard to get certain tubes, and maybe it was just not worth you know for that price point of that amp putting those tubes in there. So it's it's I my theory has been and will be for a long time, and is that my theory is is that inexpensive tube amps die; they just go. They go away. The tube prices, just the availability of tubes, the difficulty of tubes. You can't have, you can't, I've interviewed and now hung out with so many amp brands, okay, that don't even know each other, which is the important part. It's not like they're echoing the same um, message because they're all the same, they're, they're in all in the same eco chamber talking to each other. And they don't even have a lot of the same vendors, yet they all have the same story, which is tubes are becoming super, super problematic. Okay. I mean, it's, it's like the bane of their existence. It's getting tubes, getting tubes that don't suck and the amount of tubes that they're throwing away, um, because the, they just, they're not quality or they don't work is getting super cumbersome, like super expensive. So like anybody with any deduction skills, you should probably come up with the same idea I'm coming up with, which is it's not going to make sense for a lot of companies soon to make, to try to focus on trying to get an affordable tube amp out, especially when solid state and modeling tech has getting so good um, that it's getting hard, you know, for the average player to disseminate the difference in the two sounds. Okay. Um, that's the, that's just the, the, the truth of it. Um, and so what I think is going to happen is it's like, people are like, Oh, modeling and profiling will win and two amps will die. I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think what's going to happen is two amps are just going to be super expensive and then it's not going to make sense to make anything that isn't a premium product and then it will just be this thing that collectors buy or audiophiles buy right the equivalent of look you can be you can be a guitar audiophile there's no there's nothing you know that that's that's a thing so in other words just like people have record collections that are just they're buying new records and they're using record players and some people are streaming their their uh, Spotify from their phone to their $99 Bluetooth speaker, there are, there's somebody like, Hey, I just want to hear all my music. It's right here. And I can stream it to a device and I'm done. And some people are like, no, I got to hear an actual record through an actual analog stereo system. And they're willing to pay for that. I think that's, what's going to happen with guitar players too, is that some guitar players are just going to become audiophiles and they're going to be like, yeah, I totally am going to pay for this premium tube amp and this premium analog sound 
because the same reason like records, it's an experience is, is a quality. Uh, like in other words, when somebody says, oh yeah, you can get the same recording sound out of, of digital. I, I totally know you can, because I have both and I record with both and no one can tell the difference. No one. But there's a secondary factor, which is the experience, the, the tactile touch of touching the knobs the the feel of the way the amp is in the room that experience has a feeling to it and then feeling is important if it is does it make sense if it's important to you it's important to me there's something i like about it but you know i was talking about the spark go just earlier on the show and i was playing spark go the entire week and not once not once because i'm just thinking about right now did i go man i just can't get the tone i get out of my amp (laughs) <laughs> I was just playing. I was playing and enjoying myself and learning songs and, and practicing and having fun. So again, so that's, that's what I think it's going to happen. All right. Um, by the way, that's also why I think the, sometimes the PRS move to kind of make, uh, amps affordable was kind of a weird move, but I love that they're trying to basically lock in the whole Cortec as their main amp builder. I think that's going to be a great idea. I think with Doug Sewell, Doug Sewell designing stuff and then Cortec building, I think we'll get a very good quality product at a more reasonable, reasonable is a hard word, but obtainable price. So, okay. Bill says, I would collect Ampeg jets if I can afford them. Um, yeah, I haven't. It's funny. This is what I have right here. <laughs> um, they, um, I have, what do I have? I have the 12, right? Is it the Jet 12? Let me look. I have the, oh, it's the J12. Is that the same as the Jet? Is the same as the J? No, it's the Jet 12. Yeah, Jet J12. So I have, but mine's a reissue, not a real one. Uh, not, oh no, mine's no. Oh, funny. Um, cause I'm like, I know I bought a real one. I bought a sixties one. I ended up selling that one and getting the reissue. So I have the reissue. Uh, mine's made in USA though. So it's old enough to where it's made in USA. Um, and it has reverb instead of tremolo. Cause I know there's some that has reverb, some that have tremolo. Um, it was one of those things. Like I came across it and then I got it. And then I ended up getting a one from, I want to say it was mid sixties model and uh, playing them both. I ended up liking the issue a little bit more. And then, um, uh, and then mine, I've even modified it a little bit. Um, I took out the stock speaker, which was not, which is fine for the amp. And, uh, I put a, uh, I have a neodymium, uh, cream back in it. And the reason I have a neodymium cream back in it is because, um, the amp was crackling a little bit, you know, the speaker was crackling a little too soon. I, I, I want it for the clean. I didn't want to drive it to get overdrive. I was just running it for the clean. I like the, the sound of that, uh, Ampeg clean amp. It's got this cool mid range tone that I like that Supros tend to have too, which is kind of cool. And, um, anyways, I switched the speaker cause I had a cream back, uh, neodymium and, or I had a cream back and I tried to put it in there, but the magnet was too big, uh, to put the put the chassis back in and then i remembered i go oh i have a cream back in a box so i opened the box and i put the cream back in there and because the neodymium uh, magnet so small i could put the put the the uh, chassis back together so that's what's in mine so there you go all right did we do it we did it two hours uh brian says uh if you want to see if phil do a Gil deep dive, let him know. Absolutely. Any, any kind of videos you're interested in, let me know. Um, I'm going to try and grab real quick. Uh, let's see. Uh, some, uh, Amanda sent me some, some cool questions real quick. Let me burn through these and we'll do some fun. Uh, this is from Ken who says, Hey, I need a stop tail bridge for my PRS SE 245. Uh, should I get the PRS adjustable stop tail bridge? Or do you have another recommendation? I don't think you should get the Fender one. Or sorry, see, this is what happens. You go for two hours. I don't think you should get the PRS one. Um, uh, the PRS one sometimes the the uh, inserts and the studs don't line up and stuff. You can get the aftermarket one. Um, let me just do it this way. I'll give you. 
a uh, hardtail bridge. Gonna add one piece. And of course, the comic will come up. Nope, okay, here it is. Wraparound adjustable, Stu Mac has it. And like I said, here's the important part. Um, that is not the one you want. Like I always say, I always say I tell you to go to Stu Mac first and just get the part number, figure it out from there. Oh, Schaller makes one. That's a good one I've used in the past with a roller one and Tone Pros. I would go with Tone Pros. Oh, kind of pricey though. Golden Age makes one. Is this one pretty good? Yeah, here you go. So let me share. So here's a uh, Stu Mac. This is the Golden Age one. So you can look up the one that works. And this one's uh, about $89. Um, the Paul Reed Smith one might be more. If Paul Reed Smith sells an SE one compatible, S2 SE, that's what you would need. I would check out that one. If they don't, don't buy the USA one from PRS. It's not going to work the same. You're going to have to change out the inserts. Um, and if you want to do that, that's fine. It's not the hardest thing to do, but you just be aware or you're going to have to do that. Um, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Uh, and then Craig says, hey, a suggestion for the first tube amp for someone who's coming from modeling. I just reviewed that Laney amp. That was pretty good for 580 bucks. That was my main focus on that. As I tell you guys all the time, you know, uh, when I deal with companies, companies are like, hey, you want to check out this amp? Um, and uh, a lot of times it's, uh, you know, the expensive amps. <laughs> it's, you know, they, they generally, companies, I've told you this before, companies generally will send either what's new or what they want to sell. And what they usually want to sell is what's not selling as well. And usually expensive stuff needs to be sold, right? No one goes, hey, I always wanted a $4,000 amp. Like that's not something that people say or a $2,000 amp, right? It's, it's the it's a hard thing. Uh, so, uh, when Laney was like talking to me, I said, can I do the 110? I'm a huge Princeton fan. And I love the idea that it's half the price of a Princeton. So that was a pretty good one. Um, a lot of people comment in the video that Monoprice makes a clone of that, but you know, I, I've never experienced that. And I, I don't know anything about Monoprice. So, I mean, that you'd have to do some research on, but, um, but the Laney one, I only thing I got from, so you know if it helps is uh um laney was making some amps in china and i guess they're moving most of the majority of the stuff back to uk i think it's because of what happened with mono price ripping their amps off but i don't know that for sure i just kind of got that vibe that they uh, they went overseas and they got ripped off <laughs> so they're going back uh it's a story uh that keeps happening over and over again as we've all heard it millions of times from millions of companies um and uh that's a good amp and then what else i mean obviously you know for your first tube amp I wouldn't put too much thought into it. You know, you can get a Fender amp, you can get a PV amp. Um, you know, I mean, it's tough. It's a tough thing to suggest. You, but I know the comment sections will flare up with, and I uh, comment soon. Um, here's another one Amanda sent, and then we'll finish this out. Okay, uh, this is Call Me Spires says i recently bought a 5150 iconic head and i wanted to get a 412 cabinet does it matter if i ran a 5153 cab with an iconic head or should i stick with the cab that was made no you don't have to stick with the amp that's matching or the ca cabinets matching here's here's the there is a there is there is a thing that they say oh the cabinets and the speakers are made specifically to match the amplifiers that is sometimes true, but usually when that's true, it's stuff is super expensive. Okay. So when you, it's not, and not always true when it's expensive, just sometimes true. So for instance, is, um, um, if, if you buy an expensive amplifier, expensive head and well, like look at bad cat. Okay. So bad cats made in the USA, they're pretty expensive. They have a custom, uh, a vintage 30 made for them in, in the UK specifically for their amps and that's what they use so that is where those stories kind of line up like should you get the right cabinet for the amp you don't have to but that's the time and effort they put into making sure those things match up but a lot of stuff especially more affordable price stuff it's all about trying to figure out what speakers are just the most affordable speakers they can put in there so in that case uh you don't have to match up the cabinet so definitely do what you want um 
you know, I have no, I have no desire to match up my stuff, my cabinets and amps. Like I said, I, I tend to find speakers and cabinets I like, and then I use those for years and switch out the amps. Um, and this came from Eddie says, Hey, Phil, you probably covered this, but just got a Mustang plays great, but the E string gets stuck between the fret and the fretboard. Ah, it doesn't seem to be sprouted. Any other possible problems? Sure. Do I need to file? Um, so it, it is, it doesn't have to be sprouted. You're, so you're thinking sprouted. Hold on, I need to go back to me. So you're thinking sprouted this way, like the fret, you know, there was the next shrank and now the fret's sticking out and then now the string's catching underneath. I understand your reason you're thinking like that. That's, that, that sometimes can happen. In your case, like you said, it's not happening that way. What's happening in your case is the fret has lifted. So how would I fix that? Let me just tell you, I'm not telling you how to fix it. I'm telling you how I would fix it. I have a special clamp. It's got a, a rounded uh, jig on the bottom that goes on the neck of the cradle and has a soft pad. And then it has a fret press. And then essentially I have a radius of the fret. In other words, a radius of the fretboard. So if your case and your fretboard is nine and a half, I have a nine and a half brass plate. I insert it in this clamp and I squeeze, put the clamp onto the fret and I squeeze it and it presses the fret back in. And then I turn the neck sideways and I use some, uh, some super glue and I inject with a syringe some super glue into there and then I press it and then I let it sit. And sometimes if I'm in a hurry, which I hopefully not, um, I might use some ACF or ACH, ACH is accelerant for the glue. Um, and it just zap it, right? And zap it up and do it. Um, but a lot of times I'll just leave it clamped. That's how I would do it. So in your case, um, the, that's how I would fix it. It gets a little bit more difficult for you. What I would Un, you need to understand is that your fret has probably lifted a little bit and that's why it's catching underneath it. It's catching on the lip, not so much because it stuck out just because it lifted enough because the string is very small. Um, you can also clamp it, but you, I've said without the proper tools, you're running the risk of damaging the neck and putting a dent in it. Um, this is something you can take to a tech. You can file it and see how it works. The issue that I worry about is this. I caution sometimes the saving a buck versus you know, destroying a guitar, a file. Once you start taking material away, you can't put that material back. Although a file can like, especially a, a, a fret and dress file, you might be able to figure out and catch all the spots and then not have that problem anymore. However, if you take that material away and now the string starts slipping off that fret, that's a pain in the ass. Clamping the fret would be the best way. Um, the sad part, like I said, I told you how I would do it. So if you don't have those tools, you could try and figure out because before I had those tools, I had to come up with different ways too and clamp things, um, clamping and gluing. And sometimes if you're also, if you're lucky, you can hammer it back in. But I also caution on price friendly guitars. See how nice I said that price friendly guitars. I'm cautioning people taking a, a fret hammer or a mallet or something and tapping on frets, especially on the end, because if it's lifted, it could be the, all the, all the, uh, the, the uh, teeth on the fret are not biting in as hard as they should be because that's one of the things that they do when they make guitars a little faster. They don't slot them as tight. They don't do things as, you know, and they don't use the best fret wire that doesn't have the best teeth on it. And so you can actually run the risk of making the problem worse. So in other words, it's not a huge fix, but it's one of those things like, if I could tell you this, if you could, if you have a local shop with a local tech that is pretty decent person, it should be a quick fix. Like, um, you know, just take it to them and say, now you know what the problem is. You're like, I think this fret's lifted a little bit. It's catching on in there. What is it? What does it cost to fix that issue? And maybe they'll throw you a bench fee deal. Um, that's something I would do in that case. I mean, if there's nothing else wrong with the guitar and that was the only thing wrong, um, what I would do is, is I used to have a bench fee. Um, I think it was $15, maybe 20 bucks. I can't remember because I think it went up to 20 bucks at some point. What the bit, what, so if you just can, in case you don't know what a bench fee is, it just means that if it goes on my bench, that's the cheapest I'm going to charge no matter what I do. So even if I look at it and go, you know, I mean, not, you know, I, I wouldn't charge you if I just looked at it and go, I can't do anything. <laughs> but I mean, if, uh, whatever the repair is, um, it just makes some comfort for my time. Right. So if it takes me 15, 20 minutes, I can just get covered for that. Um, they might have something like that. Sometimes you get a sweetheart, you get literally a guy just goes, Hey, yeah, look fixed come back and buy strings again. So that's what I would do. Or like I said, now that you kind of know what the problem is, you can probably see if you can figure it out yourself. Just like I said, just be gentle, right? And uh, be cautious to not make the problem worse because you can fix it easy, but you can mess it up. Um, and don't do that, obviously. 
Okay. Um, I think that was it. I know Amanda sent another one. Hold on a second. Uh, Amanda, I think she sent me a question, but it's about finish. Um, Min, Ming Zhou, 101. Man, I'm not the guy to ask for finish stuff. That's really a Nathan question. So, okay. So I think I got most of those too as well. Um, thank you guys as always for sending those to me. Thank you guys for entering the contest. Uh, once I have the other winners uh, respond to me, I'll get those out as well. And, um, oh, you guys are saying you're close to 500 thumbs ups. Hey, if you guys get 500 thumbs ups, you know what happens. <laughs> we have 500 thumbs ups. <laughs> so as always, I want to thank you guys so much. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Again, thank you to all our veterans for their service, uh, you know, and uh, have a great Veterans Day weekend as well and um <laughs> and um play guitar why don't you do that that sounds fun and i'll see you guys next friday and then i have a video coming out monday and i think one more during the middle of the week and uh so look for those if you could i'd appreciate that as well and as always i want to thank you guys for your time and then uh the know your gear podcast